following is a presentation of the iRacing Esports Network. Formerly the final round of the Formula One calendar. This track holds a special place in memories in so many drivers and fans alike. Who can forget Ayet and Senna and Alain Prost two years in a row? Who can forget the Michael Schumacher charge through the back? But when it talks iRacing, when we're at Mie Prefecture, when we're at Suzuka International Racing Course, and with qualifying underway, you know that this is going to be a very, very telling race. Three rounds left before the end of the season. Qualifying underway on the iRacing Esports Network. Jake Sperry, Jonathan Simone brought to you with RaceBot TV. And Johnny, this is the track which you call the Red Bull track. It's the track which high downforce rules supreme around here. But qualifying is going to be so, so telling. Kronke is currently fastest. Yeah, welcome back, everybody. The, the interesting part about this track, as you mentioned, that it is very technical, setup driven, driver driven as well. Narrow racetrack, minimal runoff areas. But also, if you think about it, they've only had one week of practice from last round to this. So less time to get the car ready. Those teams with bigger numbers will have more drivers as dedicating time to testing and approaching this racetrack. What's interesting now, Jake, is qualifying track conditions, 26 degrees Celsius. Most drivers have been preparing for a hot race here today. We're going to see quicker conditions. Who's going to adapt to that in this qualifying session? Who indeed? Josh Rogers in the 92 then making his way to the line to set his first flying lap time, 130.291. He goes fourth as things stands. The championship could not be any more interesting right now. 29 points splitting Martin Kronke and Mitchell Biong, the two teammates who need to make things work. And then it's about 110 odd back for Gregor Hutu in third position. We're on board though with the five-time champion Gregor Hutu looking to set his first flying lap into this beautiful turn one, turn two. Bravery is tested at every single moment as you make your way now through this wonderful sweeping S's section. Slower and slower as you go and Johnny, this has not traditionally been the Gregor Hutu track. He has not finished in qualifying inside of the top five in the last two seasons. Is this what you call a bogey track for Gregor Hutu? It could be. Race pace could be a different story. And he's currently struggling on this qualifying lap. The car just isn't gripping together. Almost beaches it on the curb there at the first deck. Now, one of the most difficult corners in all the motorsport around the world. Tough braking zone here at the hairpin. And you don't want to lose traction there. You don't want to heat up the tires or else you'll struggle through this straight. Drivers have had trouble keeping the car on the tarmac through this straight. The tire model in iRacing, not friendly at all. Here he is through Spoon Curve. You want to ride the curves just slightly. Turn in earlier than you think through the second part of Spoon. And then this long straight to 130R, Jake. Right now, he'll be looking at his deltas. He'll know it's not the best lap time here around. And that could get into his head because, as you mentioned, he's had two years here where he's qualified outside the top 10 both years going for the championship. Kevin Ellis Jr. moves up into third. Yao Vaz for a Ryan race team. Now into fourth position. But here comes Hutu looking for the line and he will abandon his first lap. Pressure. Off track. Davy de Corps moves himself up into third with a fantastic qualifying effort as Marcus Jensen moves into fourth right now. Pash Jurgis up into fourth now here. The new Coanda boy. Yeah, and good stuff for Pash in his second race for Coanda. David Corp, so that's even more impressive. We never see David Corp up there in the top three. And a great performance by him. Here's Mitchell de Jong now. He hasn't set a time. What you saw happen at Gregor, as Mitchell there set two rapid sector times, Gregor had an off track here at this final corner, and he had to abort the lap. Otherwise, he'd receive a penalty, but the lap wouldn't count anyway. 
Mitchell De Jong smooth on the traction. That's been the Koanda signature at Suzuka. Just smooth on the throttle. And Mitchell De Jong only P2, but the front row for his championship challenge. Front row, so the title contenders P1, P2, and it is a Koanda 1, 2, 3 with Peter Berryman in fourth position. Antoine Higelin in position five, having a fantastic qualifying by his standards has been a little bit out on the wayside for the last few rounds. Hasn't shown maybe some of the potential that he has had, Johnny, but certainly a welcome return to form by the Apex driver. Yeah, Antoine Hegelin, he's still young, he's still uh, hungry, and he's definitely putting in a lot of work to improve. And he's in an up-and-coming team, definitely the second strongest team this season behind Koanda, who has really been a one-man team for Redline. You can't really classify him in that as we look at Rogers here through the difficult section that is, or that are the Degna curves. And again, the hairpin right now, it's almost so difficult because during the race, they'll be qualifying while turning. You don't want to lock up that front right heading into the corner. And then he takes a tight line here on the run down to Spoon. It looks easy, Jake, but I can tell you the drivers have been struggling just to keep the car on the tarmac once those tires heat up. Yeah, they certainly have been. And Josh Rogers proving that even coming out of Degna. Jamie Fluke moves up into fourth position, a 129.917. So it is Koanda 123, Apex 456 as things stand. So really a two-horse race. Gregor Hutu still yet to set qualifying time, the only red line car. But here's Rogers for Burst Esport, making his way to the line, out of the Casio Triangle, final corner, trying to just be as gentle as possible, making his way over. 130.120. It's a welcome jump, but only one that puts him at best eighth position, Johnny. Yeah, not good enough for Rogers. And so he's got a, a lot of time to make up. Well, I think that's it for him for qualifying, isn't it? So that he will not start any greater than the eighth position. Who to now? He is on an outlap, and we're seeing what uh, Mitchell De Jong is also doing at the moment. Just a, a slow outlap. Who to though? He's actually on a hot lap here, excuse me. You can see the timing at the bottom of the screen. 32.2, respectable first sector. Could look good for a front row here for Gregor Hutu if he pins the rest of the lap together. Well, we will see into that fantastic hairpin, slowest point, or one of the slowest points on the circuit, then on the power for 200 right. This fantastic 280 kilometer an hour pulling through the gears. Of course, that's the part of the track where Daniel Kvyat a couple of years ago had his massive, massive moment in the Formula One World Championship but for Hutu he knows he's got to find a lap time the worst thing he can do is not have a lap and start from the back especially when it is a very very long out lap to try and get yourself back into play and with under three minutes remaining qualifying this lap has to be set and has to be gorgeous right now heavy over the first part of the Casio triangle nice and neat through the second part little wiggle as he gets himself over to the line Hutu 130.269 that is not a Gregor Hutu lap he is outside the top 10 again Johnny yeah and he can't qualify any higher he's used up his first lap if he doesn't outlap that's going to be it his limit for qualifying will be over so Gregor Hutu we thought it couldn't get any worse for him at Suzuka that's a career worst at Suzuka if we have to go back and look at the stat sheets for Gregor he's qualified outside the top 10 back in 2015 and 2016 as well and here again we know in 2015 qualified in 14th 13th in 2016 he's gone one worse here today in the 15th position and it's not even done yet and he was only six tenths of a second slower. Here's De Jong, though, needing something. 129, three, five, six. What a mega lap that is by Mitchell De Jong. He's beaten Martin Cronke's time by two and a half tenths of a second. And that was sensational by the X Games gold medalist. But Martin Cronke has one opportunity to respond here, Johnny. He's got one flying lap, one opportunity remaining. Yeah, let's watch through turn one. DRS open. DRS full power. Lovely. Lovely through the first corner. Up to fifth gear here. Even up to sixth, he's going that fast. Now just pedaling through these the S's section. Nice lines, trying to save as much time as possible. Don't touch the brake through that corner. Just release the pot pedal. Let the car ease itself into the corner. Undo the weight transfer. Now through the Degna curve. Spot your brake marker. And Martin pinpoint perfection goes down to third gear so interesting for martin down an extra gear some drivers gone to fourth through the exit 
out of the second deck in the corner. This looks like a good lap from Martin Kronke so far. He's always left it to the last second, Jake. Let's see through Spoon and through the rest of the lap whether he gets this correct for a Martin, pole position. Martin Kronke knows that if he goes Banzai, he leaves it all on the table for the second lap. The first lap normally a sighter. This is now where he throws everything at it over the curb with two tyres on the exit of Spoon. And now the charge to the fabled 130R, that legendary overtake between Alonso and Schumacher at 315 kilometers an hour. He charges, hits the brakes, looking for the Casio triangle and a magic, magic lap. 129.356, the only man who can beat him is this one. Number five, two-time reigning champion, 129.448. It's second, it's a better second, but it's still not enough to go quicker than the 24. Kronke gave everything, but Mitchell De Jong, he loves Suzuka. He is one cut above. Qualifying is complete. This is how things will look for the starting grid. Kawanda, one, two, three, but it's the California kid, Mitchell De Jong, on pole position, 129.356. He leads Kronke in qualifying with Mac Backham in third position. Apex take fourth, fifth, and sixth. Jamie Fluke followed by Peter Berryman and Antoine Higeland. Charles Sturgis will start from seventh with David Williams in eighth. David de Corpse is ninth. And Marcus Jensen, the first burst esports driver in tenth. Tommy Erskard and Josh Rogers will be on row six, with row seven being locked out by Ilka Harpala and Kevin Ellis Jr. Yao Vaz in 15th with Gregor Hutu all the way down in 16th. Stephen Michaels, Ricardo Roscoe, Dion Verges, Michael Partington, Paul Ilbrink, and Balaj Remnick round out 22 for qualifying. But stay with us, fallout from qualifying coming up in just one moment's time on the iRacing Esports Network. one week between two different races sometimes it can be a tough run on the mind but of course the momentum it generates is absolutely sensational Mitchell De Jong the fastest man in qualifying on a 129.356 he's beaten Martin Kronke in qualifying a rare feat that you can say over the last two years Jonathan Simon standing by with a flying lap So here it is, Mitchell De Jong, we got it on board. Starts a lap, starts it wide there as well. It's the best run. Flick on DRS for this first section. You can see he's already revving in eighth gear up to 330 kilometers an hour. You want to take two apexes into this corner and flips that second apex nicely at turn one. 
and good on the traction here. Here's what you want to use all the curb, and the Coanda car has been just retrospectively one of the best cars uh, using curbs in all of the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix series. They've just set up that car to perfection. Dunlop curve here, full throttle. Be careful of the bump right here, mid apex that can send the car flying into the barriers. The Degna curves, toughest corners in all the motorsport. It is that difficult. No runoff at the exit. So if you make a mistake, you're basically out of qualifying. And then through the braking at the hairpin here. Try to straight line this as much as possible. Easier in qualifying, much harder in the race with a fat load of fuel on board. It's hard to take the inside line here on the run out to Spoon, but Mitchell can do it because he's on low fuel and plenty of traction, fresh rubber. Brake just where the tarmac is on the right-hand side. And then turn in earlier than you think for the second Spoon curve. That's the best way to head out of there. It's off camber, easy to apply traction. You look out for drivers there during the race who may be on worn tires, struggle to get the rear end out of the second spoon curve. And you want to go full throttle through here. Sometimes we'll downshift to seventh, but Mitchell has carried enough speed. He's going that fast. He'll stay in eighth. Some drivers hate to use the curve there, but as we said, that Coanda car is just insane on the curbs. Shortest line to the flag there. Flicks on DRS just for those last few moments. That is a rapid lap time, Jake, from Mitchell Deong, the American. And I guess he was just motivated from, uh, from all the stuff that happened in the past week. He uh, had, was half a second off pole last time out at the Nürburgring. Now snatches it all to himself. And I, I guess that's a good thing to start off with, Jake, because Mitchell Deong at Suzuka, and we're expecting the Circuit of the Americas later on in the season, they're two really strong tracks for him. They certainly are. And you look at Mitchell de Jong. He knows that he's got to try and take points away from Martin Kronke as much as he can. And he knows the only way he is going to be able to do that is if he can finish ahead of Martin Kronke. Spa-Francorchamps, maybe not the circuit that he wants with two races to go. But at the season finale at Cota, he will want that opportunity. But I just want to take a look at... Let's take the top three out of perspective just for a second here. Johnny, because you've got 4th to 16th split by just 3 tenths of a second there or thereabouts. And for Gregor Hutu, 3 tenths of a second, that's the difference between him starting on the 2nd row and now on the 8th row. And if he's got to deal with 12, 13 more vehicles going through the field, we've seen how Gregor Hutu can make those runs, can make those races, but there are some very tough cookies and some tough characters who will not give Gregor Hutu an inch. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he did start 14th in 2015 here and still ended up on the podium, but it, it wasn't easy. And that it definitely should have been a race he won. Uh, Hugo Luis, who's behind the scenes here at RaceBot, told us when he used to race against uh, Redline, they were obviously slow in qualifying. But then when you got to the race, they were actually the quickest team in the race itself. So uh, Redline, we don't know what's going to happen here with Gregor Hutu come race time. I have to say, though, team, uh, some words from his team boss, Dom Doohan, is just that... In the past week, he hasn't had that much time to practice. And look at these small teams along those lines. You know, Gregor Hutu, basically, or essentially a one-man team, Jake. Look at Burst Esport. Rogers and Jensen, two young drivers, could find setup difficult for themselves. First year, well, second year for Jensen in this car, but first year for Rogers. You know, setting up the car with one week practice, that's where you need a big team, all putting in hours and all putting in the effort. That's where you need experience. And right there, this is why we always see in these one-week break events, especially at a track like Suzuka, you see the grid shuffled around like this. It's quite interesting. Yeah, it is very interesting. And what's more interesting as well is the championship standings because Martin Kronke, yes, he didn't win last week when he got to that fantastic race at Nürburgring. But what he was able to do was still extend that margin over Mitchell De Jong. Over a Mitchell De Jong, he's had to play catch up on for the majority of this season, Johnny. And I think now at crunch time, Martin Kronke is turning on the afterburners and going, you know what, Mitchell? I'm here to spoil your party. You're not going, you may be fighting for three iRacing championships this year. But I'm going to try and make sure, to the best of my abilities, that you are going to get none. Yeah, exactly. The problem is for Martin is that Mitchell starts on pole this race. And if Mitchell heads away and, and wins this event, we know Mitchell made a pass on Martin here back in, I think it was 2015, when Mitchell claimed uh, his second victory in the championship. And he ended up winning the race. So th the thing with Mitchell Deong now is if he wins this race today, he'll gain 20 extra points at least on Martin Cronke. That's if Martin finishes second. Um, 20 points difference, you get 100 points for a win, 80 points for P2. 
he'll bring the back uh bring the gap down to nine points the problem is they had to spar next jake and that is a martin cronke track he's i don't even think he's had a dollar and one cent to win that race he's at a dollar i think the betty market's off for the win you know martin's gonna win that one but it's the circuit of the americas round that plays to mitchell's uh, favor here so Mitchell's going to hope that, um, you know, if he's if he finishes 1-2 for the rest of the season and Martin wins Spa, it's not enough. So he has to hope for a mistake from Kronke or, or just have to do something extra special at Spa for Mitchell Dion. Or maybe need a bit of help from his Dutch teammate, Matt Backham, or a finish help from Gregor Hutu or anybody else who decides to get themselves up onto that level. But let's talk Apex for a second. Fourth, fifth, and sixth at a track which they said that, okay, maybe we're not feeling as strong as, but to have three cars inside of the top six, Fluke, Berryman, and Higelan, there's a lot of strength that can challenge that Koanda block at the top if they play their cards right off of the start of the grid, Johnny. Yeah, it definitely is. And race pace will come into play as well. I mean, I, I just think they're going to struggle uh, Apex to sort of catch the Coanda duo. I think they're really battling here for that fourth position and just staying ahead of the guys of Georges behind, Williams and the rest of the crew. So uh, those three are in a bit of trouble. Sad not to see Kevin Ellis Jr. up there. I really feel like he had some extra pace, but uh, Kevin Ellis Jr., who's he, looking strong, should have finished fourth last time at the Nürburgring. He's going to find it even tougher here to make up for it today. But uh, just, um, yeah, those three are looking strong, as you said. Very impressive qualifying performance from Anton Higelin. Yes, and it's also been a very impressive qualifying performance from Davy de Corpse and David Williams, both who you'd normally find, Johnny, on the nether regions of the top 15 there or thereabouts. But de Corpse had a great qualifying at Road America. It didn't work out for him after about three corners. David Williams on that battle for the bubble, shall we say, for the top 20 positions... This race could mean a lot come the end of the season. 22 drivers, 20 positions only keep your license. There's a lot riding on this for those looking to go and try and keep their license, those who may have to go through the road to pro. Yeah, exactly. For David a Corpse, though, it's not a career high qualifying performance. See, that Road America performance, as you said, was, uh, was very good from him. But for David Williams, it's not either a career high qualifying, <laughs> career -high qualifying performance. Uh, he was back in the World Championship back in 2011. And uh, back then, he put out some uh, insane uh, race performances. Even had a podium at Spa, which is coming up next. For some reason, these My 3 ID branch and Coanda Duo cars, uh, they all seem to go well at the, the Spa racetrack. But uh, those two respectable qualifying performances from there. The challenge for Suzuka now, Jake, depending on track conditions, we're expecting a two-stop race. If it's cold, a one-stop may work three stop whether it's cold or hot there's just too much time to travel through the pit lane you're going so slow through there you're rocketing across the front straight at 300 kilometers an hour it's a, it's a strategy that not many people want to elect to hope for so up the tire pressures have them high make those tires last for a two stop and that's probably the best strategy here today to be safe Let, let's invoke the verb to del orco which is the strategy to do a three stop or more when it comes to racing action but Johnny, before we head ourselves then over towards racing setup, let's just talk about this track very, very briefly. It is very different. It is Japanese asphalt, which is a very different characteristic. It suits some drivers. It doesn't suit other drivers. And this is where we'd expect maybe a team like Radicals to come up to the forefront. Unfortunately, no Mishima here today. Partington probably one of the best that they could hope for. And down in 20th position... Radicals haven't turned up today. No, they haven't. So I don't know if there's just been a lack of testing behind the scenes because that's the best way to explain this. Uh, Mike Partington was a lot quicker at the Nürburgring. So uh, that's the only way to look at this situation for that team. They were on the front row here, Jake. We were talking about that as we see Partington fly off. Uh, where is he? I don't even know if he's on the racetrack here. He's uh, completely off the track there in qualifying. And um, yeah, they were on the front row. Was it 2016 here? We had yes. Filio first, Umashima second. Obviously, they fell back during the race. And it's just because they've just never figured out the tires. I think that's something Mac Backham spoke about as well, is that you know we all thought it was ERS issues, but there were some tire issues too for Radicals back in the day. There certainly were. And of course, this is going to be very, very telling on those tires. The ERS will be used at full capability, but we are going to step aside very briefly here on the iRacing Esports Network, ladies and gentlemen, because we are getting ready for the race. Suzuka always promises. Suzuka always lives up to its reputation, and we know how good Suzuka races have been in the past. 
And my goodness, are we set for a titanic title scrap between De Jong and Kronke. No holds barred, three rounds to go. It's time to put your money where your mouth is. See us in just a couple of minutes time as we get ready for racing here on the iRacing Esports Network. Last year, I was sitting at a desk as a sales manager. And now, I'm official McLaren F1 simulated test driver. This opportunity is huge, huge. Alex Lobby, driver of number, number 36 in the NASCAR Xfinity Series, and I'm from uh, Montreal, Canada. I'm here at High Racing Headquarters, just uh, logging some laps on, on the Roval. It's a brand new track, nobody's been there before. Uh, even us Xfinity guys, we were not allowed to go test before, so I think it's a pretty good test to do a couple of laps here and uh, learn the layout. I think it's going to be tricky. It's going to be uh, it's going to be fun to drive by ourselves, but I think it's going to be really tough in, in the traffic just to overtake people, and especially the infield because it's uh, Whole new pavement, so it's uh, it's gonna it's gonna be pretty tricky. But I think it's uh, we're gonna have to be there at the end, to survive because there's gonna be a lot of things happening for sure. <laughs> I started on i racing in um, 2010, I think, just uh, doing like short tracks because I was a short track racer and just helping me out. And then when I started doing the Xfinity series, I re it really helped me learn all the new tracks because it was always the first time I was going to, to the tracks and all the ovals and especially like like the road courses like uh, the Roval and I don't know Middle Ohio Road America, Watkins, and it's. It's it's a lot a little longer to, to learn. So if I if I could use the I use the platform in the weeks prior to the race just to get the, the track in my head and uh, be up to speed quicker on the track. I think it's probably like if I would have run 10 to 15 laps in, on on the real track for sure at least because uh, I mean we I, I know I've, I've been through I, I've been on iRacing uh, before and I know the tracks are really really close to what what they're in real life. So just uh, small stuff I I can learn. I, I think uh, I can apply it like directly on the track when I when I get there and it's. Uh, it's a lot because you. I mean, like I said, you get up to speed quicker, and you you make a lot a lot more gains with the team. And especially we're a smaller team, so we can't really run. We like on Thursday we're we're gonna run some laps, but we can't run as much laps as a big team. So just to come here and uh, and lug some some good laps, it's uh, it's gonna be a huge help for for this weekend. Heading down towards the Parabolica. And uh, we're getting all set for the start of three hours of racing around Monza here. And uh, certainly going to be a good race. We're waiting for the green light. The green flag doesn't drop yet. It's down the line. Now the green flag comes out. Away we go then. Three hours underway here at Monza. As they head down towards Ritzfilio to start with. They're going three, four wide further down your field. Hopefully everyone gets themselves sorted out as they're heading to turn number one now. This first chicane, so easy to make contact around here. We've got a car spun. Car spun and we've got more to
53 laps in the land of the rising sun. Suzuka is our stage. And of course, our actors all on track. 22 of them all hoping to get a victory and two fighting for one big championship. 17 turns, 5.8 kilometer lap here on the iRacing Esports Network. Round 12 of the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series. Let's take a look at track conditions here today. It is cloudy here in the afternoon in the Japanese sun. 30 degrees only on the track with winds coming in from the northeast, gusting around 13 kilometers an hour with rising humidity at 47%. And Johnny, this is a crucial, crucial race. For Martin Kronke, it is damage limitation. Couldn't get the victory last time out at the Nürburgring. Not on pole here. He needs to get around first and foremost, Mitchell De Jong. If not, he's got to stay as close as possible. Yeah, qualifying didn't go well for him. It didn't go the iconic way for the German. Setting that lap in the last seconds was only good enough for the front row, but they can see the championship standings on screen. That is why it is damage limitation for our two-time world champion. 29 points ahead of the American Mitchell De Jong with a race win here for Mitchell De Jong. If he can get it done over these next 53 laps, he could cut the gap to at least nine points, depending on where Martin Kronke finishes. And that's going to be so crucial. So many times this year we have quoted Mitchell De Jong, this is my last great chance to win an iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series crown. My last great chance, and he will take that to the bank. Gregor Hutu will start no higher than 16th position, and he will have a lot of troubles to go when he's got things going on. But of course, we need to talk strategy around here today here Johnny because this could be a one-stop race it looks more likely to be a one-stop race but a two-stop is so viable in these conditions yeah exactly I mean I think there's probably an 80% chance it'll be a two-stop race in these conditions if anything these are perfect two-stop conditions mostly cloudy skies 23 degrees Celsius in ambient temperature 31 degrees Celsius track temperature. So it's perfect two stop conditions, as we said. Any colder, the one stop would work for a few more drivers, but we'll see who will take that gamble today. If you're three stopping, that is certainly overkill. And what we've noticed, Jake, across uh, testing is those drivers who lower their tire pressures by a bit too much may be three stopping the race, maybe faster over one or two laps to start the stint, but towards the end of the stint, They'll need to pray that the lower tire pressures do not send those cars into the barriers because it is that difficult to handle. Once it gets to about 10 laps through the stint, the car just starts to oversteer and the drivers have just struggled to handle that. They certainly will struggle and that's what they have to keep on avoiding here at Suzuka. More importantly though, there's a lot of people who get it done for us at Racebot TV. Firstly to And Wern Designs, the official graphics partners here at Racebot TV with ATVO and Engineer, the official graphics engine with animations brought to you by Simon Grossman. Live timing scoring will be available after lap two. That's brought to you by Nick Disson, as well as track cams 22. Our cameras brought to you by Istvan Ballo. Make sure that you check them out as well. So it seems that Johnny, we're in for a really good race here. One minute remains before we take ourselves to the starting grid. Can I say, and Wern Design, who designed our beautiful graphics overlay for RaceBot, also designed Sergei Sorotkin's helmet this weekend in Formula One, so check that out. He also did Valtteri Bottas's earlier on in the season. Uh, he's just one of the, definitely the best designer. What am I saying? One of the, the best designer out there in sim racing or motorsport in general. He's that, uh, that valuable to us at RaceBot, Jake. So uh, that's what I'm looking forward to, to the race, seeing more and Wern Design uh, overlays on our coverage. <laughs> Oh, yes, indeed. We are getting ready then for the starting grid. This is how things will line up then as we get ourselves ready for action at Suzuka. Mitchell De Jong will be on pole position here with Martin Kronke, his title rival, championship leader, two-time reigning champion, alongside Mac Backen will start third with Jamie Fluke in fourth. Row three is all apex, Peter Berryman and Antoine Higelan, followed by the second all commander row of Pashalis Jurgis and David Williams. David Corp starts ninth with Marcus Jensen in 10th. 
And then you see scrolling down on your screen the rest of the grid. The likes of Gregor Hutu in 16th position. Kevin Ellis Jr. in 14th. The likes of Michael Partington, Paul Ilbrink, and Balaj Remenik. The last three drivers on this 22-car field. It's a shorter race here at 53 laps, but it is one that will always be challenging. Tires will go off incredibly quickly, and this will be one where he who tries his best, he who can manage his vehicle the best, will tame this beautiful figure eight circuit. One of only a couple on the iRacing service that we have. And my goodness, is Suzuka the most famous of the lot. But for Mitchell De Jong, it's about destiny. For Martin Kronke, it's about continuing a legacy. And we just get ourselves ready then, waiting for the green flag to drop. As it drops now, we're getting ourselves underway here. It's a slow start there from the fourth row by one of the Koanda cars, and immediately going heavy defensive over the grass goes one of the Koanda cars at the front of the field. That was Kronke desperately trying to find a way past De Jong. No given quarter at all, as they almost made contact into one side by side behind, as that's Higgeland trying to battle it out with David Williams. Higgeland wins out that battle. My goodness, Johnny, we almost had Senna and Pross all over again here with the two Two teammates. It came really close, didn't it? And it's for the championship, as we said. Meanwhile, behind Williams with a great start, Jurgis has fallen down a few positions, so he just didn't get off the line well at all. But that almost became calamity between De Jong and Kronke. In the end, though, they survive another day. But it goes to show how hungry De Jong is to claim this championship here in 2018. Well, he wants it. He knows he won't get himself there. There's contact in the middle of the pack, and that's one of the Orion cars. That was Kevin Ernst Jr. and David De Corps coming together at the hairpin. It's given Hutu a position as now just behind De Corps, Orozco and Partington and begin to battle it out. So drivers getting a little bit antsy then in the early stages of this event here, Johnny. That was not what was expected from drivers here. Maybe just a little bit of work to happen as Jensen now starts to attack David Williams. This one crucial to 130R. The nose to tail as they head through. Yeah, look how close this is between the two. Now the run down to the Casio Triangle. Oh, alongside each other here, Rogers and Jensen, the two teammates. You don't want to collide here coming out of the final corner, but here's a shot for Pascalis Georges to claim another position. He's currently in 10, hasn't lost any other spots since turn number one. Rogers on the defensive, no DRS at this stage of the race either, and Rogers just a bit more confident on the brakes, and Georges will have to slot him behind. Yeah, he certainly will. Live timing and scoring then will be available. Head over to racebot.tv forward slash timing for that one. Seven tenths of a second then, says Mitchell De Jong's at the front of the field. Kowanda lock at the front as things stands. Peter Berryman up one into fourth position. Some of your big gainers, Josh Rogers up three. Marcus Jensen up two positions. Gregor Hutu is up four on the back of this train. He's trying to get past Kevin Ellis Jr. Both of them trying to work their ways up through the field at this stage. But we've been seeing here how it has been good starts for Gregor Hutu. Certainly a race pace driver as he tries to get around the young Scotsman. Yeah, Ellis Jr. involved in that. Clash at that corner there, the hairpin with David Corpse on the opening lap. Looks like David Corpse has turned in on Ellis Jr. Ellis Jr. did slot his nose there a little bit late. Dirty air through Spoon here. There's a lot of fuel on board in this car. We're looking there ahead as the driver of David Corpse, who's got a damaged front wing as well after that incident, Jake, and that's going to probably mean a long pit stop for him. He's starting to fall behind here on the front stretch, and I certainly think that David Corpse in an Orion racing car may have damage for the rest of this event. And that's going to really hurt because that will cost him at least six seconds when it comes to the pit stop window. One driver is out of this event. That is Michael Partington of Radicals Online Colors. That's not going to be helpful as Ricardo Orozco desperately tries to stay in tow with the corpse who is struggling here 319 on the straight heading towards turn number one was being closed down in drs now firmly in activation your top three split by just 1.2 seconds they're all working with each other to break away they're thinking at this stage johnny okay if we can get rid of peter berryman we can start fighting amongst ourselves and have a proper race yeah exactly you're going to break through from the pack just have a comfortable event on your own uh, interesting to see though everybody right now in the event 
all the way down to P19 are all within a second of each other. Balas is in 19th, over a second behind Tommy Erskine. But that is how close it is in your battle for victory. Don't forget Mac Backham, who's currently in third behind his two teammates. He could also be in a shot here for race victory. It was a horrible start for Tommy Ersgard. He's dropped seven positions off of the start. The corpse has dropped four, as we have noted. Ilka Harpala has also struggled. He has also dropped seven positions as he, the Finn, who has race wins in this series back when this car was run in an IndyCar, D or I believe it was a DW, no, it would have been a DW12, it would have been an IRO5. IRO5. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. As he looks to try and get past Race Clutch's new driver, Balaj Remenik, the Hungarian. This one now for 19th position out on track. You can see using the draft well, but not close enough on the braking zone to the Casio Triangle. You need to be tucked up underneath within about a tenth and a half, Johnny, if you want to make that lunge. Yeah, exactly. Harpala now. We don't, we're not sure it's really gone wrong for him, but he'll have DRS here. He's got a damaged front wing, so certainly... Another Orion race team car with damage. Easy move past the race clutch driver of Balazs Remenik. An official race clutch driver now, Jake. This is his second race with the team. Was on loan last round at the Nürburgring, but here he is now officially on board with the group. As now Paul Ulbrich all over the rear end of Balazs here, but just cannot find a way through the S's. And Paul Ilbrink knows that he is in that relegation scrap, shall we say, on the bubble as he tries to pick up a, a tight line through the Dunlop curve as they head to the first of two Degners out on track. Always difficult to make a move at Degners 1 and 2. So Ilbrink, not close enough, but how brave do you dare to be at what is known as Kamui Kobayashi Corner? He loved making yeah. overtakes here, but not able to is the Dutchman Paul Ilbrink. He will have to sit in line and wait just a little bit longer. Marcus Jensen, though, he is a man under pressure, and he's just run slightly wide there. Two contrasting lines through Spoon Curve, the second part of it. This allows Josh Rogers an opportunity to close down in. I wonder if team orders may come into play in this one, Johnny. Allow Rogers to go out there and attack with Jensen, maybe a more conservative and more consistent driver. It's too early, and it's too tight in the pack, I think, to do that. But you're right. Something to consider later on, because right now I think Jensen... He's still within touching distance of David Williams, at least with DRS range. We're riding on board with Rogers. You can see all the way screaming up to 325 kilometers an hour. Only in seventh gear. Doesn't shift up to eighth. You can hear the car revving there as well, Jake. Just abusing the engine is the young Australian. So Rogers now tucked in behind his teammate. So the gap's now up in front. Berryman in fourth is now out of DRS range of the three Coanda cars in those top three positions. David Williams in seventh, out of DRS range of the three Apex cars from fourth to sixth. So the race now starting to stretch out. If you can make it to lap 17, you will be two stopping this race. Pit any earlier and you're probably three stopping, but I don't think any driver will be electing for that for sure. No, I don't think any drivers will be electing for a three-stop strategy. David Williams under pressure as well by Marcus Jensen as that train continues all the way back to the courts. Behind that, though, Ricardo Orozco for University Isabel first. Positive sim racing under pressure because there's Stephen Michaels. And there is also Yao Vaz and Tommy Ersgaard in this train. Dion Verges desperately trying to hang on to this one here, Johnny. But... This middle pack, this middle to late pack, Stephen Michaels has had some good charges up through the field. New rebirth with race clutch in there. Road to 2020, trying to get everybody as a professional esports driver. But Ricardo Orozco, the man under pressure, but is starting to pull out here on this lap. Now, Ricardo's a good driver. He's well improved this year, and so I don't think he's going to be an easy pass for Stephen Michaels. The positive sim racing driver up ahead is just... Orozco's had a good year, I think. He's been uh, consistent. He's improved consistently as well. He's appeared race to race as well. Doesn't just have a license and doesn't use it. It doesn't turn up to all these races and, and waste all these grid spots. He actually shows up, which is a good thing. And he's doing well so far. P14, claiming some good points here. See where he ends up anyway. Stephen Michaels, though, is starting to edge in closer and closer. There we look. Up ahead of them, Gregor Hutu still locked in behind the Apex Racing UK driver of Kevin Ellis Jr. No chance he's getting behind the young Scottish man. No, no chances just yet. Kevin Ellis Jr. is one of the smoothest and most consistent drivers. But Johnny, we have noticed over this year that he has been favoring the one-stop strategy more and more, even when the two-stop has maybe been the better option on paper, shall we say. So Kevin Ellis Jr. likes a strategy, sticks to it, 
sometimes would you argue that makes a little bit easier to understand what a driver's doing if they keep going to the same playbook do you think that drivers should be switching up a little bit more yeah you don't want to be paul deresta and always zero stop or one stop you want to actually uh, make some good stops here and uh, be be challenging you know two stop if it's a better option for kevin ellis jr he is pace so far high 33 so he may really be electing for that one Ooh. stop who knows we'll see what happens next time round of action on the racetrack though yes we do david williams has actually just lost a position out on track that was to marcus Jens, and that was a mistake coming out of the hairpin so through the hairpin he goes and oh he goes broad sideways there johnny trying to save the vehicle and marcus jensen says thank you very much that's about the greatest gift i could get from david williams apart from a christmas card at the end of the year but that for david williams a rare mistake and the problem for williams is once you do that in the car the car becomes ever difficult especially at this stage of the stint to handle it's going to be like driving on ice at the moment as we watch david williams now through the degna curves this is still a replay actually with david williams because uh, ironically, he's at this part of the racetrack as well, live. He'll come through to the corner here. Second gear. Applies. Oh, it just snaps like that. You can tell the tires are starting to go away for the Coanda driver. And here's the difficult part. If that happens to you at the hairpin, he has to back off the throttle in this straight, bizarrely. Otherwise, the car could spin off into the barriers at 300 kilometers an hour. The iRacing tire model, not friendly for this world-class talent. No, it's not, and you have to be so, so careful about how you manage those tyres. Let's go back live, though, to Kevin Ellis Jr., the 98 Apex Racing UK. He's got the Greek freak, Pashalis Jurgis, just in front. This is the battle for the final spot inside of the top ten. Jurgis currently holding himself about a two-and-a-half-tenth of a second advantage, extending out more and more to the brakes, and no chances to make the move just yet. But the DRS train in full effect at the moment, and this is where you start thinking okay if i was on the one-stop strategy do i convert to an early two-stop well that's uh that's the question they still get until lap 17 to the side as ellis jr oh ran a bit deep there into the first corner but picked up the pieces towards the middle part of the lap you do have to think about strategy at this stage of the race kevin ellis jr always has david strid as his engineer david strid uh, <laughs> a guy i've thrown punches with before virtually He's a good dude, though, and he's uh, we'll have a laugh about that, certainly. And he's got a, a great, passionate team behind him, Kevin Ellis Jr. Heading through these Degna curves. Now, they're so difficult. You don't want to beat yourself on that curb, either. And the traction zones here take such a toll on the rear tyres. Look from the rear end of Georges now to the hairpin. No look for Ellis Jr. Tommy Ersgaard is out of the event. This happened at turn number three. He just gets himself too heavy over the curb. The vehicle snaps and he goes backwards into the tyre wall. Doesn't look like a heavy amount of contact, but for Ersgaard, that is day done for the Norwegian. And for Koanda, that's a rare retirement. So Ersgaard now out of the event after what has been a pretty poor day by his standards yeah i mean his poor driving standards on lap one his rejoin wasn't really that good and then he just made a drive error there just touched the grass on the outside they've all done that during testing he's just unfortunately done it when he, he doesn't need to and uh yeah out of the event so just a, a simple drive error trying to widen the line which is what all the drivers are trying to do there to start the lap but those guys had better races for sure and he'll be looking forward to the next round at spa certainly has let's get a replay then of what happened at the start de jong and kronke are still within one second of each other but it could have been the other way around and it could have been absolute disaster between the two koanda cars johnny yeah look how close this was and kronke on the grass oh man that's exciting one of the best starts i've ever seen in the series just in terms of pure entertainment and look at the spins behind so that's what happened to Erskard. Erskard's there at the back of the pack now retired and i believe that was ilka Hapala. So those two collided there at turn one. And later on, we know Partington was involved in some drama. Ellis Jr. at the hairpin as well. Here's the rest of the field coming through. He's riding on board with De Jong, Jake. And again, this is going to squeeze Martin onto the grass. Well, he made sure that he left racing room and maybe a little bit less than that as well. Martin Kronke knew that it was going to be defended by Mitchell De Jong. How aggressively, he did not know. But my goodness. They may be teammates, Johnny, but they know there's a championship at stake. Once you know there's a championship you're fighting for, you don't give your teammate anything. 
No, certainly not. We're looking at Erskard now. So what's going wrong for Tommy Erskard? It's so narrow here at this racetrack, and yeah, just collided with a driver off track, no grip, and then again, different contact. So just a rejoin there. I mean, look, I don't really think Erskard did much wrong. I think he just... I mean, where else is he supposed to rejoin, you know? We saw some comments from others, and... Yeah, I don't know. That's, that's a fishy situation. I don't know what else Erskard can really do in that situation. When you're forced off the racetrack or you have contact, it's not like he was trying to cause an incident. Something to look at later. Something for the stewards to decide. Here's the young Dane and Marcus Jensen. That's a clean start for him. Does anything happen here with Marcus Jensen? Eh, no, just a simple start for him, I guess. Yeah, very simple start for Marcus Jensen. Let's go back live, though, and just get an eye on what's happening at the moment because we're starting to see more fragmentation of this field as Jensen tries to stay with his old teammates at Apex Racing UK. He's struggling. He's two seconds off the pace. But it's small packs of three that we're seeing. Jurgis now, a bridge between the divide here between himself and Josh Rogers. And this is not helping Ellis Jr. or Hutu's race here, Johnny. No, it's not. George's lap times are now low 34s, so Kai is certainly dropping off. Ellis Jr. is still high 33s last lap round. He did a couple of low 34s, but his tyres really handling quite well. Hutu is managing his tyres quite well too. If anybody has to one-stop, Jake, you'd think it'd be Gregor Hutu. I think it would, and Gregor knows that if you're going to do something in this race, you've got to think outside of the box and I think he's got no real other alternatives from where he is lap 11 though we start out of 53 and I just want to keep an eye on Mac Backham in third position right now he's just been very very quiet he's been staying around seven tenths eight tenths of a second away from Martin Cronkett at the front of the field and Max just playing that patient game. He doesn't want to get involved in this type of battle, but he knows if he has a really good pit stop and he plays his strategy right, he said he wanted another win this season. This could be his best chance. Yeah, and unfortunately, it's at a time where if you're Mac Beckham, you don't really want to win in this situation either because you're like, I don't want to affect this championship battle between Mitchell and Martin. Uh, he won't really care about that, of course. He'll be gunning for victory. And you'll be saying, okay, while well, you two squabble, I'll do something out of the ordinary and just slot myself into P1. So Mac Backham here is the X Factor in this race. He certainly is the X Factor, which means that he may be a certain wrestler we may or may not be able to talk about. But <laughs> for the moment, at least, we do have a good scrap going on. Ricardo Orozco versus Ilka Harpala. This one for 16th position out on track. This is behind Yao Vaz versus Stephen Michaels, which is going on for 14th position here. So Harpala on that recovery drive hasn't really had too much to work with, but I have to say the race pace has been so consistent through this field. We're 11 laps into this event, Johnny, and the top 17 are still split by just 17 seconds. Yeah, it's been very close, and now the mistakes are going to start to come in. 10 laps through the stint. This is where the tyres really start to drop off. Rogers. Just looking how close he is getting to David Williams. He's at the final corner. Here he is on screen. Both he and Williams may have had a moment through Spoon Curve because they lost a bit of time through that sector. DRS for Rogers, not for David Williams. Will Rogers close in on the Coanda veteran? Being part of that team for almost a decade already, David Williams. He's a veteran of sim racing and the young man in Rogers trying to claim the throne for himself. But here he is through the SS section, just not close enough. But as I said, Jake, now is the time where the tires just start to, the car will snap, oversteer more. Here's another corner, Dunlop curve. It's impossible almost to go full throttle through here. Rogers takes a tighter line to avoid the bump. And it just be, could, become a, could become a race of attrition for the rest of this stint as the pit window is almost about to open. It certainly can be, and losing DRS for David Williams is disaster because Marcus Jensen has been the big help. Wide line through the hairpin then from Williams. This allows Rogers a chance here, the young Australian, to start thinking about okay, going aggressive. How does that make that work? Also worth talking about here, Johnny. Mac Backham is out of DRS range. This could be a two-horse scrap. There's a vehicle turn around though oh, out no. on track and that's Jamie Fluke from fourth or fifth position in the race no contact just driver error oh god not for Jamie who was driving so well oh he's done that all on his own and that's a, again that's the tires he's gone in too hot the car will snap like that that's just what's gone wrong for, for Jamie Fluke the tires are that abhorrent I mean they're, they're 
so difficult to handle. And we could see that happening to more drivers. The problem for Jamie now is he just, I mean, he's going to have a, unless he pits, the rest of this stint's going to be chaotic for him. He's already about to be passed here by David Corpse. Around the outside, De Corpse looks with the damaged front wing, but he's not able to get past Fluke. And now Fluke behind Gregor Hutu et al on this train. That drops him back to 12th position in this event. Seven positions lost on one costly spin. And it wasn't much at all. Just the back started to step out there, Johnny. And just like that, it's gone. It happened so quickly in these MP430s. You need to be lightning reactions to save it. Yeah, not even. I mean, I don't even think reactions could save that. You know, it's just this car is so challenging. The iRacing time model is so challenging as well. The car will just snap on you like that. You, you, you shouldn't really need to be saving that. You should be driving in a way that prevents a moment like that from happening. And Fluk just... Unexpected, you know, at a stage like this in the race, he cannot be making those mistakes. And for Jamie Fluke, he's just going to be lamenting that error. At least he got past lap one this round, but it's not a good race for him so far after that spin. No, it's not. He needs to just gather himself up and make sure that he has another go. As again, he just has a little bit of a moment coming through Spoon. David Williams, though, he's still underneath that pressure and he's still looking to try and combat Josh Rogers here at the end of lap 13, starts lap 14. So close they go through the left right of the Casio triangle and you can see just how the dirty air effect really hurts this final corner and this run onto the front stretch it means that you've got to do so much more work Johnny to try and make a move into turn one and two yeah exactly we're trying to look here well there was Williams behind him as well Ellis Jr was close to Pascal the Sturgis there they are on screen Hutu is even close to that as well he just appeared in the background look how close those three are so that battle's tight, so is Higgelin, or so is uh, Jensen Williams Rogers, as we said. And it's a, it's a good race so far. I'm enjoying this, uh, Jake. You know, the three stop window opens now on lap 14. Jamie Fluke, you just can't go for it. If you can extend this thing to lap 17, you might as well two stop. But can Fluke, someone like him, survive for these next three laps? Look how much this spin has cost him. There's no damage to him, Jake. And he's lost time to Gregor Hutu, who's in P11. Fluke was running fourth before this. Exactly, and that just tells you something. The times in position four were 34 twos. They are so, so similar. Williams still just pulling away from Rogers. They were nose to tail coming out of the hairpin and then into 200 right. But through Spoon again, Rogers just running a little bit wide, trying to open it up. Williams struggling to apply the power down, but it's a very, very even game. Battle of attrition, as we keep on saying here. Gap around two tenths of a second. I think Rogers wants to attack here. I think he wants to make a move. If he finds himself close enough, they'll come to the breaking zone of the Casio Triangle. And what's more, Rogers will just have to sit and wait in the tow because he does not have anything to answer here to get past Coanders Williams. Yeah, behind him as well. Ellis Jr. is close. Rogers also Ellis in that battle. Oh, someone pits. Kevin Ellis Jr. So early pit stop as he pitted a bit earlier for that two stop. Will he try to extend his next couple of stints? Go one lap longer in each of his next two stints. It could be the case for Kevin Ellis Jr., but I think those tyres look fine for him. He just couldn't find a way past the driver of Pascal Sturgis. No, he couldn't. Also in is Ricardo Orozco and Jamie Fluke. So Kevin Ellis Jr., who is traditionally the one-stop guy, deciding to go for the aggressive two-stop. So very out of character for the Scotsman, and out oh. and away they should go. Ellis Jr., side-by-side side with Orozco, coming out of pit road. Orozco was immensely quick when it came to his stop. And look at this. Oh my goodness, who's going to win out on top? Oh, where is he? There he is. Oh, don't collide, boys. You're both having great races. What a pit stop from Ricardo Orozco. In the meantime, Jamie Fluke had a penalty, I'm pretty sure. 20-second pit stop for Jamie Fluke. The race has gone bad to worse for Fluke, who should have been in the top four spot. Here's a replay. And look at that, Ellis Jr. with DRS as well. You could not make that more exciting. No, you certainly couldn't. That was sensational work between them and also a penalty for Jamie Fluke surely as well in that situation, getting very, very close to the line. So Orozco got his way around the both of them. That was some very, very smart stuff from Kevin Ellis Jr. there. That was a titanic battle between them. Any more takers then onto the lane? Will anyone cover off the move? The answer is going to be no at this oh. stage. Gap at the front, down six tenths a second. And Johnny, you see something. Sturgis crashed in front wow. of Gregor Hutu. So 
This is the corner right now. We can see on screen the Dunlop curve. As soon as the tires give way towards the end of the stint, the car will do that. Oh, and he touched Gregor as well. So Hutu's come up with some damage. Oh. Nothing that Hutu could have done, but again, that's how unsafe these tires can get at this stage of the race. It snapped. He was into the inside wall. He's trying to save it, and Hutu gets a piece of it. And for Pash Jurgis, that's going to hurt, and Hutu will not be pleased. He escaped to the grass and just ran out of road to try and get that one back. Hutu did everything possible and only lost one position out of that. In fact, he negged nothing in the end because he only lost a position to the corpse. So Hutu with the damage. My goodness, Gregor Hutu did so well to slow that up before heading himself towards that Degna barrier. That is the mark of a champion to get yourself out of trouble. Oh, that's insane by Gregor Hutu. And if you think about it, Hutu's also got worn tires. Hutu did everything right. And I'm not even sure if Hutu... He certainly got clipped by the Greek freak, Pascal Sturgis. Not a Greek freak today after that spin, but... Oh, man, this is so exciting towards the end of the stint. They certainly damaged that Team Redline car on the left-hand side point, I think. Otherwise, that's just the glare of the sun. Oh, I'm speechless. Jake, turn for the worst this race for a lot of drivers. In comes Peter Berryman and Antoine Higelin then for Apex as they come onto pit road. Apex are on the two-stop strategy then here today. And that's going to be telling for this event because they want to do something that puts them in the wheelhouse of Koanda. Harpala has a moment. It was almost as if he was trying to think about coming onto the lane oh. there, Johnny. And then he had a huge, huge issue. You see something. And Jensen's also had contact at turn one. Jensen's lost the car and he was clipped by a Coanda driver behind of David Williams. Oh. So again, drivers are struggling to keep this car on the tarmac towards the end of the stint. Two-stop race for sure. I'm sure some of them are considering three-stopping at this stage. And how Josh Rogers got away from that on the outside, <laughs> I will never know. Marcus Jensen has a moment, gets on the curb, car gets unsettled as he goes around. Williams is left in no man's land, and Rogers just escapes the skin of his teeth and gains two positions for it. It's pandemonium here in the land of the rising sun, and right now not even Oda Nobunaga could find a way out of this melee. Oh, uh, well, we weren't lying, were we? The tyres are really uh, proving the test of this talent. I'm just watching the replay again. Yeah, this talent today is really being tested. We're seeing the world's best drivers struggling. You know, imagine your, your amateur who picks up this car for the first time, Jake. There is no chance you're making it through a single lap around this circuit. Rogers here around the outside did everything correctly, slowed down for the incident, took a wide line, took to the grass. You pick up an off track, but it's the safest thing to do. A 1X is better than a 4X. And just a bit of luck goes his side as well for the Australian. And broken is for the first time in this event, the DRS gap of one second. And it was a mistake from Martin Kronke at Spoon on lap 17. Even the great Martin Kronke, the two-time world champion, makes mistakes. He got sideways, he corrected it, Johnny, but four tenths of a second he lost trying to save the car. It's what happened to Jamie Fluke, isn't it? Just snapped on the curb. And that can happen to you in this car. And Martin Kronke now, that was a really important gap. Because now this race is starting to play into Mitchell Deong's favor, at least in this early stint. We've seen David Williams make a pit stop. We just saw the camera pan to him earlier on. So one of the Coanda drivers in. Martin on lap 17. Uh, just surviving another day. And it's worth noting where he will come out in comparison because David Williams is in an island on his own. He is behind Kevin Ellis Jr. by a substantial margin. Most of that probably down to the damage that was sustained on that instant with Jensen, who is still out there, but now he's leading a train. Jensen, the corpse, and Hutu. So for Marcus Jensen, you feel right now in this situation, Johnny, that, okay, he's had a moment, he can now gather it up, they're probably going to lose time to Apex, but they've got to be careful. In comes your race leader, though, Mitchell De Jong, followed by Kronke, followed by Backham. Oh, the Coanda driver's working in unison. That's teamwork to the max, that's deadly. It just it reminds you of the early 2000s Ferrari era, doesn't it? Just how well that team worked. And all three of them now, it essentially is going to be De Jong out on top if he gets his pit stop right. Look at the, well, there's a stricken car of Jurgis in the way. They'll fly through that. Any mistakes from the bunch? No, clean pit stops. Look like De Jong will end out on top in the end. 
Yeah, very good. Three clean pit stops. Now, I wonder whether they're going down the two-stop route, mainly because the tyres are going away. Yeah. They've seen the state, but not only that, to cover Apex off as well. Not only that, but I'm looking at, like, Hutu, De Corps, Jensen in front. We're just talking about Jensen. If these guys are considering one-stopping, you've got to question everything you thought about life today and for the past how many ever years you've been alive re-question it if they can one-stop this race because this will make no sense there is no doubt like it is almost impossible there's rogers and there are the three drivers behind uh, it is just insane i mean you could pit on like lap 22 do a 30 lap stint to win this race but even that's just impossible and look at Kronke, he's stuck behind Ilka Harpala. He's trying to find a way through. Harpala gets out of the way, though, for Kronke. Let's him go. Knows he's on a different race strategy. There is the quote-unquote yellow helmet syndrome coming into play there with Martin Kronke and Ilka Harpala there, Johnny. Yeah, is Harpala going to get out of the way of Mac Backham? This is close. Where's Backham going to appear on screen? There he is. I was going to say, Backham looked close to Harpala, and here riding on board with... Mac Backham, straight past, isn't he? I think. Dirk Hapler. Who is uh, Backham going to appear on screen? There he is. So Hapler is definitely going to let him through. But uh, up ahead, though, anybody pitting? Rogers doesn't pit. Jensen doesn't. Hutu doesn't. The core continues. These drivers are really stretching out this opening stint. Well, they want the one stop. So this is going to be a very, very tough race for those who want to go and make it happen. They will get the best of the tyre life on the next start of the stint. But from there, it's going to be very, very tight between them. And I think some overtakes are going to have to be done come the end of this event. Harpler now under pressure from Peter Berryman. This one for eighth position on the road, net fourth on the track as things stand. So Berryman looking to try and find a way through. Through the S section though, it's so difficult because you're always setting up for the next pass. You're almost playing chess. You're trying to think two or three moves in advance. Okay, how do I get past this driver? Yeah, definitely not at Degna, please. Thank you. Yeah, you don't want to be doing that. Degna curves are <laughs> not an overtaking spot. Great drive out of the final corner. That's what a fresh set of rubber does for you. So lap times at this stage, for the likes of drivers who are pitted, such as Martin Kronke, with a pass there on that lap, we'll find out what his lap times are this time round. But certainly they'll be gaining at least two seconds a lap on those up in front who, surely, Jake, not one-stopping, as I said. If you can make it to lap 22, that is the absolute earliest you can one-stop at. But even then, that's too oh! early. Off goes Rogers into the wall out of 130R. And Rogers is effectively done and dusted with that one. A huge lapse of concentration. The tyres let go on him and straight into pit road he goes. Johnny, you were just saying how the one stop could be so dangerous. And that's why, Rogers, that car is almost done for the rest of this event. Even with repairs, that's going to be slow. And so the Australian now lamenting another, well, he was leading. Some good laps here, wasn't he, Josh Rogers? And again, the car just let go at that corner. It's not an easy corner, 130R, along with Spoon and along with the Dunlop curves. They're the three killer corners that can really catch you out. And Josh Rogers is going to have a very long stop here. He's only ever led one lap before heading into this event, Jake. A few more laps there, and that was the end of that. That was, and at the same time, Gregor Hutu found his way past Davide Corpse into turn number one. So Rogers has the big moment. So then let's get a replay brought to you by And Wern Designs, the official graphics partners of RaceBot TV. Let's get a look at Gregor Hutu, and that was as easy as you like. Down the inside of Davide Corpse, who does have the damage, and Hutu made sure, okay, I'm up in second position for now, but my one-stop strategy now, let's just be a little bit more cautious. Yeah, for sure. So Hutu now, that pass took... He started 16th, he's currently in third. How long did that pass take? That pass took... Uh, how many laps? 21 laps to make that pass past David the Corp. So he finally made his way past. And Davi now... is uh, slowly going to be reeled in by Mitchell De Jong, who's now travelling through 130R. There's Mitchell De Jong behind the scenes on screen. So if this one-stop is to work, Hutu would want to pit just before Mitchell De Jong passes him. And at this rate, Mitchell De Jong, 1 minute 32.7 last time round, who to a 1 minute 34.4. That is the dangerous difference in lap times between the two. 2.2 seconds, and the gap between them on circuit is now underneath three seconds. So 
De Jong's going to get there on this lap. He may catch the corpse, and there's going to be just a golfing difference between the tyre lives right now. As we'll get yourself our top 10 on screen after the pit stop window has concluded. But my goodness, what a race we are seeing here. We say it, Johnny. Suzuka never lets people down, and we are seeing arguably the most interesting race that we've seen all year long. Uh, certainly most dramatic so far. One of the most dramatic. Remember, Monza was along the scales of drama, as we're seeing here at Suzuka. Through Kobayashi Corner they go. Is it actually called Kobayashi Corner officially, or is that just me? That's Am I the only you. one? No, oh, well, well, let's call it Kobayashi Corner. It should be. Love Kamu uh, Kobayashi. One of my favorite F1 drivers of all time. Oh, yes, but now through Spoon, start seeing here the corpse under pressure. De Jong so much easier when he gets the power down into 130R. He's going to just angle his way to the inside. The corpse does not have much to fight with. And down the inside, De Jong gets it. You saw how the corpse moved out of the way. Of course, the Ryan race team, the former team of Mitchell De Jong, no love lost between them. And now De Jong has got to get past a five-time world champion who he has hit on no less than two occasions so far this season. And that's Gregor Hutu, Johnny. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be doing that. Uh, this time around, it looks like Hutu is definitely not going to be winning this race if Yong and the two stops are going to get past him at this stage. But Jensen and Hutu, almost certainly one stop in this race. So is Decor. It's still a long stint, though. I mean, Jake, like, 30 lap. If they pit now, 30 lap second stint, I don't think that's good enough for a two stop, uh, for a one stop. Very optimistic. The lap times say otherwise. Where's Dion going to make his way past here? There's Jensen. He's so close to the fin up ahead. He's not going to make it into deck number one through the exit here. He's going to have so much traction, almost dangerous amounts of traction. But Hutu, ultra smooth on the throttle. Will Dion fly up the inside? Hutu, slightly defensive there, Hutu. Just taking a little bit of a tight line, telling Dion not to slot himself up the inside. This is where it's dangerous. You don't want to be making a move here. It could go all wrong for Mitchell Dion, who's going for oh a championship. My. Backs up the throttle as well and lives for another day. There's Mitchell Dion. He's playing with fire. The longer he waits, though, the easier it gets for Kronke to close down, who goes down to the inside of Davide Corpse and takes the position away. So here comes the drive down to the inside of Gregor Hutu and an elongated run which Hutu backs out of through 130R and says okay Mitchell we've had our fun you're through now but next up comes Martin Kronke for Gregor Hutu and I wonder will there be a pit stop here from Jensen to release no I think Mitchell Jong's going to have to do it on circuit but crucially for Kronke Hutu dives down onto the lane and Kronke's got fresh air so you can hear Hutu now, down to second gear, third gear. That's the quickest way to make your way through the pit lane without speeding. 60 kilometer an hour limit here. Third for his box. Hutu, remember, he's in the championship charge as well. Look at Jensen and De Jong there on screen. De Jong can't find his way past. It was a quick stop for Hutu, by the way. But in the meantime, the battle for the lead continues. I have to say, Jake, we're forgetting that Gregor Hutu is still mathematically in contention for this championship. But he needs both De Jong and Kronke to run into issues. It's not a formality at this stage that he will yeah. be able to do anything to influence things. Look at De Jong. Will he send one up the inside? No. He has to wait and look at Kronke now. Right on the rear as is Mac back. And great run off of the exit by Mitchell De Jong. He goes the long way around at 200. Ah! Oh my goodness, Mitchell De Jong. That we have seen some fantastic overtakes this year. We've seen Hutu's one on Kronke. We've seen Mac Backham's on Rasmussen. I think that just eclipsed the lot. Oh, that was insane. And just the bravery and the trust you have to have in Marcus Jensen not to lose the car on Pirelli Rubber as uh, Kronke also gets past the 130R. On Pirelli Rubber, that's 24 laps old. So Jensen continuing, he'll have to pit now not to lose a position to Gregor Hutu. I think it's done. I think Hutu with the undercut, two and a half seconds faster than Jensen, should make his way past. We'll keep an eye on this. And Gregor Hutu, just for comparison, finds himself at Spoon Corner. And he is behind Ricardo, Orozco and David Williams out on track. So a lot of time that he has lost, but he has a lot of time to gain that back. In comes Ilka Harpler then on his one stop at the end of lap number 24 as Marcus Jensen now hits his box looks to get up looks to get back down and out and away a very good stop around four seconds as he looks to try and get himself back 
on to track and up to racing speed. But look at that. There goes Gregor Hooten. Oh, it is just gone light years away is around the outside rogers desperately tries to make the move on the exit on his own teammate the two burst boys going together and for the moment at least jensen behind teammates for how much longer remember mclaren shadow is firmly a thing for jensen here johnny yeah that's true too so we don't know how jensen's gonna fare in that competition but here riding on board with 18 year old josh rogers sailing around the outside that's something you need to practice. You need to go into practice over the past week and try that outside line. See how much speed you can carry in there. And then the battle continued here through the S section before they formed up. And Rogers, with all that damage, setting a 32.5 last lap round. Compared to the driver of Mitchell Dion, who's on older rubber, 33.9. So Rogers with the damage, still quick. I thought his race would be over after that hit. No, he's managed to get away with one there. It's all oh, Davy the Corpse runs wide through the Casio Triangle. And I think that's your cue, Davy. It is. He dives down onto pit road. The tyres shot after 25 laps worth of racing here at Suzuka. And he will look to try and make that first, that final stop. Oh. That's the only time. I think that's the last drive to come down in and make a stop here, Johnny. It looked like Davy sped through the pit lane on the entry. Now let's have a look how long this pit stop is. Let's have a listen. Got to remember about that front wing. He will have to slow down and change that. That will take time. But look, he's holding, holding, holding. That's a, That's penalty. a penalty. Yeah, you're right, Jake. That's what happened to Jamie Fluke as well earlier on. David a corpse, at least on entry. It looked like, at least from what I saw, it looked like he was going at least 15, 20 Ks above the limit. So huge brain laps there for David a corpse, who Jake was having one of his career best races so far. Yeah, he was, and well, that's going to hurt, but he knew he was always up against it in this event. So 15 seconds stop and hold, it just edges out and makes life a little bit more difficult right now as things go. But I just want to keep an eye on this little battle that we've got going on. Forecast scrap, David Williams, Kevin Ellis Jr., Yao Vaz and Stephen Michaels. They have charged the field. Michaels currently plus 10. Yao Vaz currently up eight positions. Kevin Ellis Jr. up five of his own. Where's Michaels and Vaz come from on the two stop? Yeah, they're looking good, aren't they? And Vaz, though, is having a... <laughs> Having a lot of technical issues this race, isn't he, Yavaz? So we don't know if he's could survive. There he is, just blinking on screen. So that's not good for Yavaz, who could find himself out of the event. But Stephen Michaels, nevertheless, he looks reliable. And that race clutch car up 10 positions so far could find himself up further. Certainly could, but you have to remember that two-stop strategy that's coming into play, Johnny. He's got to be so, so careful about what he decides to do in the second half of this race. Certainly does. Here we're riding on board with the driver behind of Kevin Ellis Jr. Who, this is what happens when you don't qualify at Suzuka well, ladies and gentlemen. You find yourself in the mid-pack. Through the Dunlop curve. We'll just back off the throttle just slightly through the bump. Now full throttle again through the rest of the corner. Yavaz becoming a hindrance in front. That's almost a distraction for Kevin Ellis Jr. It's just, yeah, Vaz has been doing that all race through, Jake. Just had those technical issues. Yep, and that's not going to be helpful at all. Your top 10 then, or your top 8, we will get up on your screen for you. Mitchell de Jong leads this one. The gap, 1.2 seconds over Martin Kronke, the two-time reigning champion. Mac Backen's in third with Peter Berriman in fourth. It's Higelan in fifth when Michael's in sixth. Yalvaz seventh. Kevin Ellis Jr. is in eighth. David Williams ninth. And Ricardo Orozco rounds out the top 10. We're going to take you Race Spot TV side by side. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back with the second half of this event in just a moment's time. The most realistic online racing sim ever made. This is iRacing. Detailed laser scan tracks, fully dynamic, real world cars, and over 50 series to choose from. Six online world championships offering over $100,000 in annual prizes. This is the original 
eSport racing game. This is iRacing. event has been anything but straightforward here as now Ricardo Orozco in the battle for 10th position comes under pressure from the five-time champion and that is a certain Gregor Hutu very very close at the moment between these two Hutu started today in 16th position on the grid Ricardo Orozco from 18th as now Orozco struggles with his older tyres, it's Jake Sperry and Jonathan Simon and Johnny. It seems that Gregor is looking for a way through on the positive sim racing driver who has everything to prove against the five-time champion. Yeah, and uh, here he is certainly Gregor Hutu now. We talked about Orozco having a good season so far, but Hutu on fresher rubber here. We'll just sail past for sure. Orozco pitted on lap 14 of the event who to who pitted uh but sooner lap 23 of the event so this rubber is nine laps fresher and who just has to make a patient pass here but here's the problem you become too patient jake and the rest of this s section here will become progressive slow frustrating and of course for gregor who he continues behind orozco losing more time and once you get bogged down, Johnny, and once you get frustrated, is that when the chances come for drivers behind like Josh Rogers to start maybe getting onto the rear and attacking someone like Hutu? Yeah, well, actually, that's a good point you bring up. You shouldn't get frustrated in this situation if you're Hutu because you're beating yourself, you're getting in your own head. What you should be doing is essentially saying, OK, I'm stuck behind him. Look at the bright side. This is a positive opportunity to save my tyres. For Hutu, don't push too hard through the S section. Save your tyres. You get stuck behind him anyway, find a positive out of it, and then get past well, later on. Again, through Spoon Curve. Some more action there, Jake, as uh, we see Hutu now through Spoon. Just taking it easy on the throttle, not wearing out the tyres, and this will be a good move. Yes, it will be. I just saw Yao Vaz have a big, big issue. Hutu side by side with Ricardo Orozco. Couldn't get it done. Get back in the toe there, son, and can't make the move yet. Can he dive it down to the triangle? You can see just trying to get as late as possible on the binders and pretty much leaves Orozco with nowhere to go. There's the move for Gregor Hutu. In comes Kevin Ellis Jr. for his second stop. Leaves him a 23-lap final stint. But Yao Vaz, I saw coming out of Spoon, Johnny, I saw him get sideways, and he is lucky he still has a car. Yeah, that's not good, so uh, we know that's going to happen there. But Ellis Jr. pitting now three laps earlier than you really expected him to for that two-stop. Ellis Jr. did make his first stop on, on lap 14, don't forget. So he was three laps earlier last time around. Now three laps earlier this time around. So he's going for a very long final stint on low fuel. Can he keep the tyres together? for these next 22 laps. 
Oh, he's got himself a bit of clean air. He's got a few seconds to pull Ilbrink and Ilka Harpala up in front. And crucially, has got out ahead of Davide Corp. So for Kevin Ellis Jr., the Uber undercut is coming into full effect here. And he knows that he's just got to go out there and get a result. Here's Josh Rogers, though. He's the next man on the train trying to get past Ricardo Orozco. This one for 11th position on the road. And for Josh Rogers, he's a lucky man even to still be in this race after his incident at 130R. Yeah, I know. I don't know how that car stuck together. And he's also making a move here for, for race position, although he's outside the top 10. And this isn't a DRS zone here. And thank God it isn't, because the drivers have to manually switch off DRS, because 130R, you just release the throttle. It's not a braking zone. And just go through. It'll be full throttle in qualifying for sure. Rogers straight through. Roscoe's been very respectful for letting everybody through behind. Jensen, who... You know, Jensen's lost out the most, hasn't he, between himself, Hutu, and Rogers, as well as, as David the Corpse, too, you know, after that penalty. Jensen, actually, if you take David the Corpse out of the equation, has ended up worse as we see some pit stops. Yeah, Vaz and Michaels both come in, both covering Kevin Ellis Jr., who makes his way through the Casio Triangle and is already past the slow Paul Ilbrink just behind him. So Ellis Jr. trying to get himself some space, trying to get himself back up and through. Coming off of pit road, here comes one, here comes two. Ellis Jr. makes his way past Yao Vaz, but crucially, Michaels stays ahead. So Steven Michaels, the American, on a great run as Ilbrink runs very wide at turn one. Yeah, Ilbrink uh, needs to know. <laughs> yeah, he just did the same thing there, but I think he just went in way too hard. Yeah, jeez. Downshifted the fifth and sixth year way too late, so he just carried too much speed. Back on the racetrack, nothing harmful there for Paul Ilbrink. Who, unfortunately, now, let's see how this race. Well, let's see what happens now. Berryman's sort of off the pace. Higgins had a good race. Two stop windows coming now. Lap 34 is where you expect them all to come in. Let's see if uh, more scrambling happens toward the end of this day. I'll tell you what is very, very telling is looking at Martin Cronke's times at the moment because over the last six laps, he's gone from being just outside of one second to now 2.3 seconds back of Mitchell De Jong. Not only that here, Johnny, but he's now 1.0 something ahead of Mac Backham. And now it becomes, okay, Cronke could come under pressure from his own teammate, Mac Backham, here. Yeah, and Cronke, I don't know if he's had traffic, but he saw the reds there at the bottom right-hand side of the screen for Cronke compared to De Jong. Mac Backham, though, last lap out a tenth quicker than the two-time world champion in Martin Cronke. This hasn't been a good race for Martin for his standards. It's still P2. It's still impressive, isn't it, Jake? But the better you are, the more impressive you are. P2 becomes almost a disappointment, especially when you're going for a championship with three rounds to go. And Mac Backham, we said he was the X Factor, didn't we? He could uh, come into play here in these last 20 laps. He certainly could. Ilk Harpler gets overtaken by Stephen Michaels around the outside of turn number one. This gives Kevin Ellis Jr. a little bit of issue here because now Kevin Ellis Jr. knows, OK, I'm in the twisty sections with a car that is slower. Harpler's pace is good for the tyres that he's got. Don't get me wrong, but Harpler has got to keep out a guy who is on two lap old tyres. Yeah, exactly. That's going to be hard. Look at the traction for Ellis Jr. coming out of this corner. Whoa, he runs deep. He may get away without an off track there, but it's certainly not quick. And then tight line through the hairpin for Ellis Jr. Second gear through this corner. You'll upshift to third. You look at him short shifting just to gain traction. You don't want to spin up the rear tires too much because then it'll be ultra difficult, as we said, on the run down to Spoon here. Break just there. You see where that tarmac was, the left-hand side. That's a, a good brake marker, a good brake reference point. For these drivers and the student is still not close enough though not yet anyway but going to try and use the draft to his advantage look at that close down in for about a tenth of a second and can he just rattle on the power you can see he's all over the back of harpler positioned well for a late lunge and lunge he does but no room there great defense from harpler there around the outside knew that it was always going to be daring but look at the chance off the exit drs in full activation there's not much you can do straight through will go kevin ellis jr as dion verges comes down in for his final of the day as does Josh Rogers around the outside goes Kevin Ellis Jr and that is another good position for the Scotsman yeah smart by Ellis Jr you don't need to go for the inside line there when you've got so much of a speed advantage on the straight just go for the outside you know you're going to have the line into turn one and a simple move just had the line into turn one like we said so well calculated by the Scot 
Peter Berryman has come down in and made his second stop. He now is behind Marcus Jensen and Gregor Hutu on circuit. So Berryman is going to have to start charging if he wants to get past the pair of them. And David Williams as well on track, who is starting just maybe to falter a little bit. But... It is still status quo. Kawanda 1, 2, 3 at the front of this field, as it has been for all 34 laps. Antoine Higgeland, though, Johnny, dives down onto lane. He should come out behind the Peter Berryman, but not by much. Let's see. Certainly don't want to feed out into traffic for Anton Higgeland. There are the drivers behind. That's Hutu across the front stretch here. Hutu's having a great race, by the way. Hutu looks good. We'll see where he ends up towards the end of the event on this... Well, we, we think it's a one-stop so far. Quick pit stop for Anton Higgler there. 4.1 seconds in and out of the box. Look at his pit entry to end time. 28.8 seconds. That is quick for Anton. And look at that. Fresh slate of clean air. Peter Berryman up ahead. Few seconds up the road. Six seconds at least. Michael's behind 12 seconds. Good race so far for Anton Higgler. Looking good for a top five spot. Looking good indeed. Gregor Hutu, though, has caught David Williams. This is the battle for fourth position out on track at the moment. Hutu trying to get past Williams, who hasn't been up at the big time end of the dance in a number of seasons. But look at that. Two contrasting lines. Hutu trying to get the power down early. Coming off of the exit and now through 200 right and be buffeted by the dirty air. But look at that. Stays within a tenth of a second almost as Hutu now waits for Spoon and tries to force mistake out of Williams who runs wide dive down to the inside contact round goes David Williams and Hutu says thank you very much but Ari Agato Guzai and Mash David Williams will not be very happy I definitely won't be happy but I think after Williams mistake there let's have a look at the replay I just think he was unaware of where Hutu was Williams did run wide at Spoon wider than usual and I don't think he calculated the the advantage that Hutu would have on fresh rubber I think that's something you need to come into play. Maybe Williams is correct. If you're on the same rubber, Hutu wouldn't, you wouldn't expect him to be so close to you there, but I think Williams has turned in. Hutu's done everything right. Oh. Now at the exit of the pit lane, most importantly, look at the pit stops here. Coanda drivers in the pit lane. De Jong in the pits. Kronke in the pits. Hutu slots out between Kronke and Mac Backham here. He splits the Coanda drivers. More importantly for Martin, he ends out ahead. And that means Hutu will not be in front of these two towards the end of the event as they no, all made their final stops. No, that's very, very telling. So De Jong has made his stop and got himself away. Kronke in second. Now Hutu in third position as David Williams comes down in and makes a stop. So now Mac Backham, fresh tyres, get past Gregor. And let's just remember at the back end of last season, in fact, let's just turn the clocks back one year ago. Backham and Hutu came together here at turn number two. We know it's a more respectable Mac Backham. We know that it is a more controlled Mac Backham. But we have seen these two make contact before. And now look at Mac Backham trying to get aggressive here through Spoon. Yeah, so Mac, who needs to get past urgently. He's stuck in third the whole race, hasn't he? Uh, isn't he? Oh, I should be able to get past the 130 yard. This is going to be telling. Hutu backs off. Hutu playing the safe game. He knows he's not in the fight with the Koanda trio. And stays behind Mac Backham. Hutu, who we're expecting not to enter the pit lane for the rest of this event. How long can he make this Pirelli rubber last? He pitted on lap 23. How long indeed. He's got Marcus Jensen behind. He's on the same strategy, but Peter Berryman and Antoine Higeland will both try and get through, as will maybe Stephen Michaels, but I think he may just be one bridge too far. Uh, also, we've been seeing out on circuit David Williams. He's come down in and made his stop. He's now behind Ricardo Orozco. And it is worth noting as well, Jamie Fluke is now officially out of the event, Johnny. Yeah, that's not good. He's had a terrible race, hasn't he, Jamie Fluke? Had that spin earlier on and ended up, oh man, I mean, just a race to forget, really. Jamie should be at least in P4 in this event. But again, you know, he's had promising pace. I guess that's what he uh, has to focus on. But again, the tyre model will end, and how these tyres just, uh, he just couldn't, wasn't really up for the challenge today. Just spun him out at the spoon curve. He certainly did, and well, gap in front now, 3.6 seconds in favour of Martin, of uh, Mitchell De Jong, sorry, over Martin Kronke. So, Mitchell De Jong now, it's just a case of he's built the gap, it's not a huge gap, so any mistake will still be punished here by Kronke, but 
He's doing what Kronke does. Build a small gap, and it will slowly grow and grow and grow as this race goes on. And for De Jong, a victory here is a vital stepping stone towards what could be a title if he has a good run here. A good run also at Kota, too. Yeah, like we said, Jake, Kota is uh, De Jong's track, I reckon, in comparison to Martin Kronke. It's been but relatively 50-50 here, but if I had to pick a driver for this race, and you know, what was my bet coming into this round, Jake? I said Mitchell De Jong will probably win this event, and it wasn't a bold move. It wasn't something to make the viewers entertaining. We don't do that stuff at race spot. We tell it like it is. And for us, we thought that De Jong was the better option here to win this event, and so far, it's not done yet. Wade, we are talking with 15 laps to go. But he hasn't put a foot wrong all event. He's been phenomenal, Mitchell De Jong. So let's see if he can really piece up this final stint together and really put the final pieces to the puzzle and uh, win this event. We will see if he does. David Corps is under pressure right now from Joshua Rogers. This is the battle for 12th position out on track. Also, Peter Berryman has found the rear of Marcus Jensen. This one for fifth position. Let's keep an eye on this one for now because Berryman is trying to get back up into fourth. He went a more aggressive on his two-stop strategy. He just needs to get past the two one-stoppers now in Jensen and Hutu. You will know Jensen's game very well. Former teammate as of the start of this season. Yeah. We look on board with Barry, Peter Berryman here. Closer and closer. Jensen, though, I mean, he's improved so much, like we said. I think his expectations have to increase, though, if he's to improve even further than he is. Through 130R for Berryman. Tires look good on that Apex Racing UK car. He should be ahead of Marcus sometime soon. So when did Peter pit? He only pitted on lap 33, didn't he? Just a few laps ago. So it should be an easy candy from a baby move, like I, like I like to coin it. And easy pass here for Peter Berryman. Well, he's just stolen the candy, and he's just stolen a fifth position. So there for Peter Berryman. He makes his way through, and he gets himself then looking at Gregor Wutu in front as the next challenge in terms of what he wants to do next in this race. For the corpse, though, under pressure here from Rogers with the DRS closing that down towards turn number one, and down to the inside goes the Australian. Thank you very much, and there's a position there for a certain Mr. Rogers as he gets himself up to 12th exactly where he started this event, Johnny. Yeah, it doesn't seem that way. He was running a lot higher after that spin. Things just got worse for him. Good move for Josh Rogers. And he's... Um, what would you expect out of the Burst Esport guys for the rest of the season? Yeah, I really think, like, Jensen at Coda last year uh, qualified second, didn't he, on the front row. I'm expecting a lot out of him come Spa and, and the final round. I expect top fives. Um, I think that's what they've got to be aiming for, just consistent top five finishes. If it's one driver, that's great. If it's two drivers, it's exceptional. I think they have that capability to do that, Johnny, but don't you feel that Burst have maybe got their eyes on different things? We've been talking about how McLaren's shadow project has been big for Marcus Jensen. He's thinking about becoming a McLaren shadow driver. He's got to go through that tournament process. But he understands that much. That will leave Josh Rogers on his own. And then Burst needs to start hiring for this championship because the last thing you can do with Josh Rogers, a talent of that calibre, is leave him on his own. Yeah, exactly. So you got to just prepare for that. I mean, Shadow Project for Jensen is not done and dusted. He still has to, I mean, he's going to qualify through iRacing and then has to win it himself, doesn't he? That's how the competition yes. works. So even then, that's going to be tough. You know, Rudy Van Buren, who is a very uh, well-renowned sim racer, uh, won that competition for McLaren last year. So it's good to see McLaren running this stuff, giving these young guys opportunities. Good to see Jensen, who... Jensen, I don't know if you have to be... I think you have to be 18 or over for McLaren Shadow. And Jensen turns 18 on the 10th of October. So just a, a week, was that a week and a half away? He's just going to qualify in time, I guess. Only just, but it's the finer margins in life that you find. And that's something else about sim racing as well. You play the rules right to the T, and that's what Marcus Jensen is doing with his age. Yeah, well, exactly. Not really the rules you expect to play to the T. I mean, you really expect <laughs> the likes of uh, you know, pushing track limits or tires and everything we've seen today to the limits. You see David Williams here, close behind David a corpse. He looks uh, very quick, Williams. As we said, don't spin up the rears through this corner. The worst thing you can do right now at this stage of the race. 
The front right takes the biggest toll, at least in my opinion, especially when you tend to, to the inexperienced drivers, especially those drivers new to sim racing will lock up insane amounts in this car. Most of these drivers will be on low brake pressure as well. I'd always recommend being on high brake pressure. That's the fastest way to go around in a Formula One car, but it's almost impossible in this McLaren. You'll lock up at every corner. Williams straight past there. Have it a corpse. Oh, well, runs a bit wide, didn't he? At 130R, but uh, keeps it together. Well, that was very, very sketchy there for David Williams. He was pushing as the corpse did lift off and save his uh, energy recovery system earlier, ERS, than other drivers or that driver Williams in front of him. So that was enough there for the corpse to allow that position for Williams to go through. But Williams now up another position, probably has some pretty fresh tyres available to him. 32 8 that last time by was four tenths of a second quicker than Josh Rogers. He's got himself 13 laps to go and the gap's only 1.7 seconds Johnny yeah it's very close between the two that's uh and it's only going to get closer and closer isn't it in these closing stages uh the battle's still progressing as well there's peter berryman on screen right behind the two. Oh, rogers have gone off uh -oh. rogers made a mistake so he's uh, continued at least he certainly made a mistake through the second deck yeah. and again so What's happened to Josh Rogers? Look at the replay here, Jake, but I think he might have beached it on the curb. That's the best way to get it wrong for Degna 2, if you have anything. Play a bit of Tony Hawk, why don't you? Gets caught on the curb, yeah. grinds it. Uh, well, he gets caught on that wooden plank underneath, and that's enough to pull him under pressure. But let's go back to Gregor Hutu right now, because Berryman is within half a second right now of the number 66 five-time champion. Berryman arguably having the season of his career so far, has got himself multiple podiums, has just been that inch away from perfection in a race victory on multiple occasions this season. I reckon a victory is possible next season for Peter Berryman if he continues in this form, and he just wants to prove it by getting past Gregor Hutu for fourth place. Yeah, it looks like victory this season may be a bit too optimistic. It was possible though at some stages, Monza was possible, who knows? Had he Imola as well, who knows, had things not gone wrong at the incident in Monza with David Williams and Ascari. Let's see if we can get uh, the number 69 on the top step of the podium and uh, hopefully do glory for himself, the team and the number of that car as he now heads through Spoon. He just can't get past Gregor here. This is a lot harder than I thought it would be. You have to remember that that tyre differentiation is not as large as it was in the opening stint. It's not a two-second difference, it is a one-second difference, which means it's easier to be more defensive from Gregor Hutu and hold drivers behind through 130R and looking on the brakes. It's late, Peter Berryman, but he'll have to keep on waiting, looking to open it up for turn number one. And again, you can see dirty air effect coming into play. If he wasn't able to do it this time, he's now got to try and turn Third number one in the draft, DRS down to the inside goes Berryman and Gregor Hutu, nothing to argue for. There's a penny for your troubles and now up into fourth goes Berryman. See, I hate strategies like that where Hutu doesn't defend, but it's the best way to do it. You have to let him through because Gregor Hutu has to be thinking bigger picture here. You know, Marcus Jensen behind, same strategy as Hutu. What about Anton Higlin? Well, he make his way past Gregor Hutu in these final few laps. So he has to think about the big picture here. Hutu needs a top five position, he needs as many points as he can get. He's still in contention for the championship. You know, things go his way, you never know. Remember 2007 Formula One, Lewis Hamilton could have won that championship in his rookie season, but the final two rounds just didn't go to his favor. And there's the driver there behind uh, Anton Higlin through the hairpin, runs a very wide line. And the Frenchman has just a couple of seconds to get past Marcus Jensen. Only a couple of seconds. Ilka Harpler is down on pit road for another stop, and that is surprising. He was one of the last men to make a stop, so it's a very, very, I'd say, unscheduled stop. But Ilka Harpler couldn't make the one stop work, didn't like the tyres potentially. But Higelan at the moment trying to stay with Marcus Jensen, trying to get past the Dane and up into that sixth position. 
out on track. Higelan, who had a very, very lightning start to the season, was fantastic around into Lagos, has certainly proven that he has pace, just hasn't unlocked that consistency to make that pace work. But here comes the opportunity to make a move, closing that gap down in DRS, full bore on the ERS. Defensive goes Jensen into turn number one. Higelan tries to pick a pocket down the inside. There may have been contact between the two of them as off goes Marcus Jensen. Oh, my word. Marcus Jensen. I, I, I'm not sure there was even contact. I think maybe slightly, but Jensen almost bottled it, I thought. That was very aggressive by Higlin, and I love it. I mean, that was good. It didn't seem like there was contact, but you don't know. Jensen might have felt something different. It looked awfully close between the two. I think Higlin, though, that has to be, regardless of it being clean or not, very optimistic and a great move by the young Frenchman. He just ultra confidence in that Apex Racing UK car. And that's what a fresh set of rubber does for you as well. I see damage on the front wing of Antoine Higelin's car. I think there may have been contact between the two. He had a wonderful overtake over Antoine Higelin at Indianapolis. Uh, sorry, Higelin had a wonderful overtake over Harpler at Indianapolis. He can't really overtake himself, can he? But Antoine Higelin proving again that he is not afraid to go for the big move. And that was as sensational as it comes. Yes, there was contact between the two. We can tell from the damage on the front. But my goodness me, Antoine. It, it takes bravery to try a move like that. It certainly does. At this stage, though, looking at the big picture for Higelin, he should pass Gregor Hutu before the end of the event. He's about one and a half seconds quicker a lap than our five-time world champion. So Higelin will have a, a top five result, which has really been unexpected, Jake, for Anton Higelin. I mean, this is a driver who has been topsy-turvy throughout his career. He's had great results, had some poor results. You know, his, his last top five result he's only ever had one in his career it was p3 last year at road america and that's very very crucial for higelan getting back that consistency getting back to a level gap between Kronke and backham has stabilized though with less than 10 laps to go it's around one and a half seconds and i think matt backham knows at this stage here johnny uh, he looks at martin Kronke. he's in a title fight Mac Backham effectively isn't at this stage because he's too far back in the points to really do anything about it. But he knows, OK, I, I don't fight my teammate in this situation. He's got bigger fish to fry. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, remember that I don't really think team orders are, are a big thing in sim racing. You don't really see it. It's anything, it's driver orders. And I think Mac Backham here will be making an unselfish sort of decision. Sorry, I'm saying he doesn't want to battle. Sorry, I've just seen Paul Ilbrink just crash out of the event. This was at 130R, gets on the curb, snap, oversteer, hard into the tyres. Reminds you of that Toyota 2002 crash, I think it was. Oh my goodness, Ilbrink, that's a scary hit. That's yeah, not good for the 36-year-old. He's um, out of the event with that. Better end of the series, Paul Ilbrink. Let's have another look at it here. The car will snap, especially towards the end of the stint. If you get 130R wrong, you need to make sure that there's minimal steering inputs. And the car just seemed to snap away. He tried to save it, and you're just in no man's land in a situation like that. So as I said, you shouldn't be driving in a way where you need to save something like that. I'm not sure if the touch did anything. The touch with the curb on the inside did anything to help him turn that around, but it, it certainly uh, ended his race anyway certainly did battle going on for 16th position the final racing position shall we say is Harpler easily around the outside of Balaj Remenik and up into 16th position it's been an okay day by Remenik standards as gained positions thanks to the retirement but Harpler making his way through doing what he needs to do there gaining that one position and this is what the final stages are can I find that one position for example can Kevin Ellis Jr. find himself on the rear of Stephen Michaels? Can Antoine Higelin get past Gregor Hutu? At the moment, it looks very, very likely in his battle for fifth position to the end of this event. Looks good. Looks very close. Hapolo as well, extremely close to... Driver ahead of Remignac. Oh, no, sorry, that pass already been done. Excuse me. Some errors here on my part. But there's the battle between... Berryman and Hutu, Hutu now. Oh, he's going to struggle. Higlin, excuse me. My timing screen's all over the place, Jake. Apologies. But Higlin with DRS this time around. Up to about 325 kilometers an hour. ERS in, in full use, but 
It's not close enough to make a move. And as I said, look at the positives here, Jake. Oh, Higgler almost loses the car there. I was about to say, don't be doing stuff like that. Save the tires, be patient through the S's. You've got six laps to make the move. That's enough time. It's more than enough time, and Hootie knows it as he is running himself lap times, which are 1.34.3s. It was a 33 flat Antoine Higgler last time by 1.3 seconds quicker on that last lap as things continue so for the moment at least Iglan knows he's got to try and get himself that opportunity thinking about the hairpin no he's gonna back out of it and wait Johnny you feel 130R into the triangle that's where Hoots has been done the most today but of course that run to turn one has also been prime so far for those in the second half of the event wherever you get it done you get it done I guess Iglan here be patient Turning earlier than you think. Dirty air is not going to help at all through the exit of Spoon. Traction difficult through Spoon. No DRS to aid the overtake here. It's not going to be done in time. Don't go for it, Anton. He does anyway and sails past Greg Ahutu for P5. Brave move by the young Frenchman. And we saw there Greg Ahutu saving ERS, thinking, okay, I think he's got me. I'm going to keep out of it. I'm going to keep out of it. Antoine says, okay, doors open. Might as well invite myself in. Take my hat off, take my coat off, put it on the hanger to the left-hand side. Thank you. I'll take that position number five from you, Mr. Hutu. And it's as easy as an overtake you will ever get on Gregor Hutu. And it's not that Gregor Hutu's a bad driver, Johnny. It's nothing about that at all. It's legitimately just down to the fact he does not have the tyre life to battle Higgler. Now, you, if you ever associate who two and bad in the same sentence, ever, you should be banned from sim racing. Not you, Jake, but anybody in general. He is that good of a driver. Who two has just been at that kind of race for him. Different strategy. He'll end up in P6 by the end of this. And it's a great damage limitation for Gregor, although he's had better results in the past. Remember a podium a few years ago? Yes, he was let through by Oli Pakla on the final lap, on the final turn. And again, that goes back to what we were talking about before, Jake. Driver orders, not team orders. Oli Pakula back in the day, I truly believe, some people don't believe him, but I 100% you know, agree with him. That was all Oli Pakula's doing. He had driver orders, let Hutu through. Now, something's gone wrong for Gregor Hutu here. I've just noticed him. He's a lot slower on the run down to Spoon. I think he's got a fuel issue. So... There's certainly something wrong for Gregor Hutu because there's no reason why you'd back off at the end of the straight unless you're saving brakes. And even then, brakes wouldn't be an issue at Suzuka. Look at him, 306 kilometers an hour on the straight. Has he underfueled the car? Alice Silverstone, which was the big passing of the torch, remember, between Kronke and Hutu, arguably the greatest finish to a world championship race that we have seen in many a year. But Gregor Hutu, the fuel running into issues 135.2 that last time by he was a full get this 1.3 seconds slower than Marcus Jensen on that lap Jensen could get past Hutu here and for Hutu this is arguably the biggest cardinal sin I think you could make as a driver and not only that he's probably done it twice now in his career with this MP430 no, it's not good isn't it what was it at Silverstone, was it? Yeah. In 2016, so final lap. What you do as a driver, though, I mean, you, you should have, with 10 laps to go, you should multiply, let's say you use 2.2 liters per lap, 2.2 kilograms per lap. That means you need 22 kilograms with 10 laps to go. So you should be checking this constantly throughout the race, 44 kilograms with, with 20 laps to go, that kind of stuff, you know, and just uh, tracking the fuel. So in case you need to save earlier than with five laps to go, because this might even be enough. You know, who knows if Greg is going to make the checkered flag? Because saving will only do so much it's, if he's one lap short. I mean, that's not enough at the moment in these final few laps. Remember Felipe Massa, I think it was 09 at Spain, at Catalonia, was going like nine seconds a lap slower just to make the checkered flag, and he almost did it. Well, that's very, very telling. And that for Gregor is not going to be helping him at all. But he knows that he's got himself just four laps to go as he crosses the line. This race led by Mitchell De Jong from the drop of the green flag. And he's had to work hard for this one. It's never been plain sailing with a gap of 4.4 seconds. Gregor Hutu, the slowest car on track right now. Worth saying that even maybe Stephen Michaels and Kevin Ellis Jr. could find themselves a way through soon. But Mitchell De Jong's had to do this one from the beginning and almost had his teammate take him out at turn one. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, no, that was close. So, uh, well, end of the day, they're all still surviving here towards these closing laps. So I just want to know where Marcus Jensen is. For some reason, Marcus Jensen, what's helping Gregor here now? This is a gift in disguise, Jake. Jensen's tires aren't healthy. Gregor Hutu saving fuel. And not only that, this car is easy to drive for Gregor towards the end of the race. So a slower car on a one-stop strategy may actually be a gift for Gregor Hutu in terms of in terms of saving fuel here. So he's only got a few laps to go to stay in front of Marcus Jensen. 34.1 for Jensen last time around. 34.5 for Hutu. That might be a little bit too quick, but then again, we don't know how much fuel he's got on board. No, we don't. And of course, you've got to remember Michaels and Ellis Jr. are only eight seconds off of Gregor Hutu, and they are a second a lap quicker. They probably won't get there, but if the fuel gets critical, and we're talking minus 100 levels of fuel, there's not much more that Gregor Hutu is going to be able to fight back with. Three laps to go at Suzuka, and we wait and we watch nervously Team Redline's Gregor Hutu struggle with the fuel calculations. And this goes back to the lack of practice that Redline have had, that Hutu has had this week, and that comes back to the fuel as well. Jensen, eight tenths of a second that last time by, brings the gap down to 1.1. Hutu's in trouble. And credit to Harrison Finch on this, who's watching the race, mentioning that with all the damage Hutu sustained from Pascal Lesturgis' incident at the Dunlop Curve, which Hutu is approaching now, that could have caused some fuel issues for the Team Redline car. And look at the lap times there. Jensen, seven tenths quicker last time round. He's certainly going to make his way past the fin. Bro, that's Kevin Ellis Jr. who's had an off, and that's a huge off through the S's section there. Was trying to apply the pressure on race clutches Stephen Michaels. Gets through the first part okay. Second part is good. It was the fourth part of the chicane, or the S's, that he gets wrong. Gets a big wiggle out of the third. Has to take to the kitty litter. And there is any chance of getting past Hutu et al gone for Kevin Ellis. Yeah, that right-hander turned six. It's unexpected you see a driver go off there. But we've seen it in the past. There's an unexpected loss of traction for Ellis Jr. You know, it, I think you don't want to mistake these guys losing concentration. I don't think it's a lapse of concentration. He's in a battle there. He's in full concentration. Ellis Jr. almost loses it at the exit of the smooth curve. We saw in a different camera here, not on the one that's broadcasted, but Ellis Jr., Again, that's what happens, Jake. You have one moment like that, the tires are overheated. When these tires are overheated in this McLaren MP430, you need a couple of laps to cool them down before you get some confidence and before you start pushing again. Certainly you do. Two laps to go at Suzuka. Gap between Hushu and Jensen for sixth place is down to seven tenths of a second. Jensen has caught Gregor Hutu and another position could go a begging for the five-time champion. So this is just the case of, OK, what can I escape Japan with and head over to Belgium for? Because at the moment, it seems nothing at all at this rate if things continue like this, Johnny. Yeah, it's... Uh, I mean, on that note, it's been a cracking race, hasn't it? Well, let's see if Jensen can make his way past. If they go through the hairpin, Hutu may have just played this to perfection here. Only two laps to go in this event. De Jong is all the way at the final corner. So De Jong's close to beginning the final lap, but we'll keep an eye on that, and we'll keep an eye on whether Jensen can get past. I think Hutu's good now. Hutu doesn't seem to be fuel-saving as much as he was a few laps ago. He seems to be fine. He seems to be fine. Also keep an eye on this one. Martin Kronke versus Mac Backham. Gap is a second. I don't expect a move to happen between them, but a mistake for Kronke on the last lap, and Mac Backham could sneak second position but it is a long last lap for a certain mr mitchell de jong who has been sensational eyes to hutu though because marcus jensen is there but not close enough towards turn number one he needs to find something again on the top speed chart hutu now starting to find that pace trying to use a little bit more he's not going at 306 now more like 320 so the fuel saving has stopped for gregor hutu he could potentially be safe then on this last lap but Mitchell de Jong's had to do it the hard way in this event. He's had to defend ruthlessly from the drop of the green flag. He put in a sensational qualifying time, which eclipsed Martin Kronke's. And as he heads out of the spoon corner, 
he knows that this championship is not over. There are two rounds to go, one of which will be in one week's time at Spa Francorchamps before the finale at Cota. Hold on to your hats, ladies and gentlemen. This championship is far from complete because through the Casio triangle goes Mitchell de Jong and stabs down a marker. Martin Cronke, I'm coming for your championship. De Jong wins at Suzuka. It will be second for Cronke, third for Mac Backham. Berryman will finish in fourth. We keep an eye on Gregor Hutu in sixth position as Higelan will finish in fifth. The fuel looks safe for Gregor Hutu. It's a short run to the start finish line and it's downhill too. On the brakes, a big lift and close. But Johnny Gregor Hutu is safe in sixth position. Oh, he gave us all a scare. Yeah, it was close. We had to wait to the final corner. You never know if Utu just had that extra 0.1 of a litre left in the car, but he makes it through, and Gregor Hutu end up with a sixth position. His championship challenge is uh, essentially almost over. Look at the battle for P16, though, right now. Ilka Harpala and David the Corpse close between these two. P16 may have... And we'll see what happens here towards the end of the race with the two Orion teammates. What could have been for the Corpse and Hapala had they not had damage in this event? They'll cross the line here in 15th and 16th. Good event so far, but Mitchell De Jong, Jake, we have to say, back into a real hard-fought charge for this championship. Two rounds to go. It could go either way at Spa, either way at the Circuit of the Americas. We travel to Spa next week. Another back-to-back -back race. We've gone three back-to-backs in a row. One week of practice, boy, this is going to be telling. And don't forget, Mitchell De Jong, he also has a challenge for him in the iRacing Rallycross World Championship. He's going to have to put, spend an insane amount of time on the simulator because that's going to be on Friday this week, or Thursday, uh, I should say Friday in Australia. And then a few days later, he's got the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series going for a championship. Busy, busy boy fighting for two titles, but official classified results. Let's get them up on your screen. Mitchell De Jong takes a big, big step towards fighting for the title. He wins here at Suzuka. The gap in the end, 4.2 seconds over Martin Cronke with Mac Backham making a Kawanda lock in third position. Peter Berryman finishes fourth ahead of Antoine Higelan in fifth. Gregor Hutu worries with the fuel and the 66 moves from 16th to 6th. Got a lucky number there, Gregor. Marcus Jensen finishes 7th with Stephen Michaels. A great result from him up 9 positions into 8th with Kevin Ellis Jr. finishing 9th and David Williams after contact with Hutu finishing in 10th. Galvaz had technical issues throughout today. He finished 11th with Josh Rogers having a scary accident at 130R. He limps it home in 12th place. Ricardo Roscoe 13th, Jon Verges 14th. Then you see the likes of the Corpse, Harpler and Remenyik. Vehicles that fail to make it to the line. Ilbrink, Fluke, Jurgis, Ersgard and Partington. We've got interviews coming up though in just one moment's time. We're going to step aside here on the Irising Esports Network. We'll be back with the post-race show after this.
about the Sunrise Land proving again what classic races are all about. It was a tough race from everybody concerned. It had everything from the drop of the green flag heading over to the end. But it was one big victory for Mitchell De Jong, who stands by with us right now on the iRacing Esports Network. Mitchell, it's a busy week coming up for you. You've got Spa Francorchamps coming up. You've also got that big challenge in the iRacing Rallycross series. But to stamp your marker here at Suzuka, to pull the challenge to Martin Kronke and say, OK, we're in a championship. I'm here to win races. Your third win of the season. How does it feel? Oh, thanks, Jake. Uh, no, I feel super good. Um, I, I was hoping to get at least one um, towards the end of the season, and uh, I really like this time when we have a few races back to back. It lets you have a good uh, kind of build up uh, for each race, and I think that helps me a lot. Um, just staying used to the car and making small improvements. So, uh, yeah, really happy with the result here. Um, the quality was really good as well. Um, just super happy with everything. Uh, no, no issues at all. No issues at all in qualifying, but let's talk about turn number one, shall we? Because it got very, very close to an Alain Prosayet and Senna form of accident <laughs> at the opening corner. Were you aware of how close you were to forcing Martin Cronke onto the grass, if not having two tires on it? Um, to be honest, I didn't really know until after. I was just looking at it and saw that uh, he even had two wheels on the grass. So, uh, you know, I, I th didn't seem like he was going to even be close enough to even uh, need to fight there or anything like that. Uh, even just getting a front wing on the inside there. Um, so I just moved over to be safe and then uh, noticing he was still going for it. So, uh, yeah, it was closer than I wanted. And um, <laughs> knowing how close it was now, I definitely would have... Uh, uh, been a bit more careful because you know even though we're in a really good position between the two of us to be able to race each other hard for the championship um, still one thing like that can cause a lot so um, glad it, it worked out nine points now the gap in the championship you head to spa francorchamps in one week's time a very very telling event it's the quote-unquote martin Cronke track as it were is it damage limitation at Spa Francorchamps, or are you going to find something maybe this week in the setup that is just going to be up your sleeve? Uh, who knows? Uh, I really like Spa a lot. It's one of my favorites. Um, I think typically in the past with this car here, it's always, uh, you know, I'm kind of struggling to just a, a couple days before get used to the car and uh, such from uh, getting back from uh, real races and stuff. So. Uh, we'll see. It's it's nice, uh, like you said earlier, about the, you know, having a few races to build up to um, the event. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Spa is a really fun track to drive. So um, hopefully that's a good combo. <laughs> hopefully it is a fantastic combo indeed. So before we let you go, Mitchell, any shout outs, any sponsors, anyone you'd like to thank for your race victory here this afternoon? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for sure, all of our teammates for putting in a lot of effort for this. Um, I think we were uh, a bit unsure um, how we were lacking so much speed at Nürburgring, but um, really happy uh, with all the guys for really uh, figuring the car out for this race and uh, doing a great job. Um, of course, all our spotters, um, Jorn and um, Philip, for doing pretty much all the work for that, um, keeping us on the right strategy. And, uh, of course, all our partners, Virtual Racing School, Hoisingfeld, Simquip, VTech, and Warren Design, Joel Real Timing, and, of course, you guys, Race Spot, for... Uh, yeah. Yeah, no worries at all. Mitchell De Jong then, a big, big step forward, a race victory here this afternoon. Johnny, you found yourself the man who finished in third position here today, and that is Mac Backham. Yeah, Mac Backham, who, well, let's drag him in first. <laughs> Mac Backham, who came home in the third position here with a podium. Mac, it seemed like a, a pretty uneventful race for you, but you might almost be out of breath. Uh, yeah, yeah, I yeah, definitely am. I think this is the <laughs> this is the hardest I've ever driven uh, in this series, and uh, oh, I'm just I'm really dead. Just <laughs> <laughs> um, talk about the race from your perspective, because we thought, oh, you could be the X factor and maybe undercut your teammates or try something different in terms of strategy. But in the end, it just I don't know if you didn't want to interrupt the championship battle, but it, it certainly showed that you can keep up with the two championship challenges. Yeah, I. <laughs> 
I mean, I gave it my all today, and I, did, I practiced so much. But uh, this, the two guys in front of me are just <laughs> insane. And uh, I, I mean, I, I really would have liked to finish higher up, of course. And we kind of wanted to go for a one stop. And so I, but then we kind of switched to the two stop, and from there it was everyone was just on equal pace. All of us when we're in clean air, pretty much, and maybe some deviation every now and then. But really, uh, yeah, there was not much you could do anyway on this track. So I think a pass would have been impossible uh, with the dirty air, unless I was suddenly so much faster. But that's not happening. So uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm really happy to finish third, and the, the, I'm really happy with my performance this race. I'm really satisfied with the way I drove. So uh, yeah, I can definitely uh, end this race on a happy note. And conditions during testing, a lot of people expecting there to be, you know, 40 degree track temp and then some people hoping for cooler overcast conditions. It was in the middle of both of them and these seem to be perfect conditions for a driver like you. Uh, I don't know. I kind of hate these conditions. Um, we, cause as I said, we were kind of going for the one stop on this and then we saw everyone behind was going for two stops. So we kind of figured we have nothing to lose, uh, by two stopping as well. We just cover everyone that should be fine. Uh, so it was not that bad to drive, uh, considering we always had fresh tires, but I, I'm not a fan of cold conditions. The car just feels really insane. Kind of, kind of like you're driving the FW 31 with some extra speed on the straight again. <laughs> And uh, anyone to thank before you go as well? Yeah, of course, I want to thank the team and the, the spotters today. And uh, yeah, everyone who helped this week with preparation. It was really good. I think this is one of the uh, races where we were best prepared for in terms of the total team. And of course, our sponsors. So that's uh, Virtual Racing School, Helsingfeld Engineering, Simquip, JRT, uh, Fitec, and uh, you guys for the broadcast. Ah, perfect. There you go. Mac Packham, who came home in third, Jake. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like Martin Kronke will be joining us in second um but who knows uh what he's going through emotionally whether or not he's back to the drawing board for the next round at spa and that is a big round for the likes of martin Cronke. and not only him but all these coanda drivers we just spoke to it's a coanda track at spa these guys are going to go very strong over there watch pash jurgis that's all i'm going to say i think he's got a really great chance of throwing himself up in there but peter berryman now joining us from apex racing uk he finished today in fourth position peter uh aggressive apex went on the two-stop strategy really the first team to show their hand today was that always the inclination from team strategy with alex simpson and co yeah, that was the stop was always the plan. I think uh, most cars would have two stopped today. I'm not really too sure what the guys behind did, but obviously the three ahead of me two stopped as well. So I think uh, it was clear that the two stop was the way to go. It was just uh, two laps longer, two laps shorter. It was didn't really make too much of a difference. But yeah, Quandas were just too strong again today. So congrats to those guys. Well, you find yourself fifth in the championship. You've put together a very good run of consistent top five finishes this year. It's seemingly been, though, that the podiums have been a little more elusive, a little bit more tougher to find this year, and even tougher the race victories. Do you feel like you are putting the building blocks together for a really strong challenge for next year, along with the Apex boys like Antoine? Uh... I'll be honest, it felt like we were making big inroads towards Kwanda, and I mean, if you had told me at the start of the year, I thought we would have been nowhere near. So to get that close during the middle of the season, I, th I thought things would be good for next year, but uh, it seems uh, Kwanda have found a another gear, and I think it's back to square one again. So uh, in terms of race wins and stuff, it's just too far at the minute. Uh, need to go back to the drawing board and try and figure something out, but yeah, I'm just looking to score top fives, maybe challenge podiums for the rest of the year and try and close out fifth place in the championship. How spell Francochamp then as a challenge? Of course, a very balanced track, well on high speeds, has nice slow flowing sections in the middle of the track. Do you feel like Spa's a track that suits you? Uh, I have no idea. I haven't driven there in a while. Uh, nice circuit to drive. Uh, I think I'll be relying on my teammates for a lot of the work for Spa because I'll be missing almost the, near enough the whole week. So very limited prep for me there. So uh, give it our best shot and we'll see how it goes. Well, it's a challenge. Before we let you go, Mr. Berryman, any shout outs or sponsors? Yep. Thanks to all the boys in Apex uh, and our sponsors, SDK Gaming, JCL Sim Racing, Leo Bodner and Simputers PC Systems. And thanks to you guys for the broadcast again. No worries at all. Peter Berryman then coming home in fourth position. But Johnny, 
Final thoughts after what has been a very, very telling and very interesting race here at Suzuka. Oh, boy. I mean, <laughs> if this isn't uh, one of the best races of the season, uh, I know Monza was pretty dramatic anyway, um, but uh, this was insane here today. So uh, just a, a delightful event. Good to see Mitchell De Jong back on victory lane as well. So uh, Martin's been pipped yet again. I mean, two rounds in a row for Martin Kronke. So... I think at a, a track like Spa, where Martin really is the king uh, of this series at Spa, and he'll certainly be trying to return to victory lane there. But this championship now, nine points between the two. It could not get any closer. The concern I have, though, is just, you know, Mitchell's got to practice for his Rallycross championship this week, and he's got to get WCS sorted as well later on. Oh, boy, is that going to be a challenge. So uh, this is something that you just need to... To really have a lot of support in your hands, eat healthy, sleep, don't go binge drinking or everything. Something that Jonathan Simon would be doing myself uh, if he was a racer. Uh, just you know, do the, all the right things and you should be fine. <laughs> no problems at all. But that's going to be it then here on the iRacing Esports Network. But not it in terms of, of what we have coming up. McLaren Shadow Project GT3 style is still going to be in full swing. Make sure that you check that out as well as the sports car open. Eight hours of... Oh, I think it's eight hours of Silverstone. I need to actually double check that one up. But wow. it is eight hours of Spa because my mind is absolutely jumbled at this stage. But eight hours of Spa, make sure you check that one out. That's going to be sensational to watch. But... We've got to give our thanks out to And Wern Designs, the official graphics partners at RaceBot TV, along with ATVO and Atgeneer for the official graphics engine. Live timing and scoring was brought to you by Nick Disson, as well as animations by Simon Grossman and track cams by Istvan Ballo and his track cams 22. Make sure that you check them out. But for the time being, that's Jonathan Simon. That's Hugo Luis with the cameras. I'm Jake Sperry. And what an event we have managed to see here. It was a tough and hard-fought battle, but De Jong is top of the mountain once again. Kronke is without a win in the last two races, and that was impossible to think 12 months ago. But it's time to head to Spa. It's time to think about the championship. Two rounds to go. De Jong versus Kronke. Sayonara.